got you got this and you got that and you gonna murder this one and murder that one yeah. talking all that bullshit i'm gonna put it to you like this yo this yo this is for the nerds this is for the brainiacs this is what we deserve go ahead and play it back you ain't gonna touch me you're not gonna do nothing you are not above me i bet you wish you was me i know it i know What is poppin' everybody, and welcome back to another special episode of the Only Friends Podcast, where you know, it's me and my only friends, which includes, but is not limited to, my boy, Tort Tua. Tort Tua? <laughs> I mean, if you're coming in the intro like that, I can't go too crazy. It's true, it's true. You, you gotta know? go with the rhythm. Yeah. You know? Keep, so, the, keep the flow going. I really don't know yeah, how I feel about NPR Connor at... Nobody cares. I, I'm, <laughs> here. <laughs> I'm here for NPR, uh, Conrad. You know, it's what, just... you've come around to it? I, I really like him toning it down a notch. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday it was two-tone. Yeah. Now, he brought it back up a little bit, but not, like, through the roof. So, it's good. Right, well, it's nice. good. Yeah. The roof. The roof. What well, are we doing here today, guys? Uh, I figured we'd have a little powwow, you know? Yeah. Maybe talk about the weekend. What do you guys got mm-hmm. lined up? Dave Matthews, baby! Woo! can't wait I, so that needs to be mm-hmm. yeah. man it's been so long since i've been to a dave show can can't you wait. sing one song for me that's pretty much what it's gonna be oh uh, yeah no, no. dolby theater Never at park mgm man that place is amazing if you ever get the chance to see a show there i recommend it it's a small venue it's uh just the lights, the acoustics, it's amazing. I not a paid ad. Say that I, not a paid ad. You know what? It's no, not I, financial advice. I think I went to MGM Grand for a fish. Okay, yeah. yeah I think yeah. I went to there. The Grand Garden Arena? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was a cool place, though. What are you doing this weekend, Connie? I'm not sure. What's going on with you? You want to come uh, to LA with me? In a when box. are you leaving? <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> let's, let's, let's address Guapo's statement first. Yeah. Uh, oh. So when you turn 45, you get an option of using Collagard. Yeah, that's where you ship in your poop. So on Sunday, I'll be I'll be shipping out some some caca. Michelle oh. will tell you that <laughs> that it's not as good as actually getting a colonoscopy. Okay. Um, it's still better than not nothing. Obviously, yeah. they said it's but, good for three years. So I yeah. sent something to our group this morning that said, "I know the IRS didn't ask for it, but I sent them a stool sample along." <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stop That's laughing amazing. for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> why uh, Why is it not as good? Well, I mean, I guess there's obvious reasons it's not as good. Is it efficient at all, though? So, like, me as, me as a 42-year-old, I don't want to go get a colonoscopy, but maybe I could just shit in a box. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I, I think I, you'd, have to, you'd have to talk to, you know, a... Uh, a licensed professional. Yeah, yeah, right. A gastroenterologist or, <laughs> or Brian somebody. But, like, um, actually, Michelle will probably know. But, like, I think because... It doesn't detect um, certain like things, the polyps or whatever, as well as like a colonoscopy. Like things could get missed, but if right. something's glaring, maybe it would show. But like right? for early detection, you know, I'm four, five, six, seven years before I'm supposed to go. Forty-five now, so it's three okay. years. Well, yeah, you know, but it I'm used a young to be, used 42. to be fifty. You keep telling yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's see what the polyps have to say about that. Listen, your ass is your ass is forty two, and you're forty two. So <laughs> <laughs> no getting around it. I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you're not as young as you think you are. That's true. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm heading to LA. Uh, I think I'm gonna fly out Sunday morning. To be you're honest, you're playing uh, Bally, Bally's live. Bally Sunday, live. Ba- sorry, Bally live <laughs> at Bally the Commerce. Only. Higher, lower. Uh, Sands Garrett. He is no longer with us. Ooh. Passed away. He passed away. Aww. RIP to this man. Um, <clears throat> the game got too small for him. And honestly, the game's too small for me too. I, I Bitcoin's up. I don't need to be playing fifty a hundred anymore. Uh, but they they made it nice for me. You know, it's uh, that's what it is. It's fifty a hundred. What's the yeah. buying? There are ten k uh, min. It's too small, ew. bro. Ten k min. Small. Brian goes ew. Yeah. <laughs> it's too small. I mean, I it's, that game. it's literally smaller than the game that I play every day. That's fifteen yeah. minutes from my house, so that yeah. makes it a little bit more obnoxious. But you're but, doing it for the people, you know. There's there's a lot of people out there that want to see you play. They want to see you succeed. Some want to see you fail. You know. So it's just 
I'm not doing You're it for the for people. Me. Yes, you are. Uh, I'm lie. doing it for some people <laughs> that, uh, you know, I'm rooting for kind of yeah. thing. But, but yeah, I mean, it's an inconvenience. Let's put it that way. But I, I'm excited to, to see the new set. I'm excited to be a part of their soft launch or for whatever sure. the case it is. Um, and it is a really good game. It, it's it's going to be a lot of action for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, all the old live at the bike regs are there. Eric Hicks is there. We're going to do battle. I'm, it may be a 10k min. Him and I will be a 100k effect for, for sure. sure. So like big pots will be played. Just because it's min doesn't mean it's a max. That's right. There's no max I big mean, guy. Just playing with Eric Hicks has to be enough to reason to want to go. He's fun. I love he's Hicks. just fun. Yeah, he's the best. He's a great. He's a great attitude. He's just fun. Yeah. What's no, he been up to? Uh, being rich. <laughs> I imagine. Hanging out. Being you know. rich. Matt, so, can you get me a bike? Um, you can borrow mine. All right. On your bike. <laughs> uh, I'll, yeah, I'll talk to him and see if he he got any upgrades for us. But yeah, I mean, I imagine at some point you just get rich and like you kind of don't care. Yeah. Uh, Show up ab- when you want about live stream poker anymore. But yeah, um, so it's gonna be me, him, Barry Woods is there. I think Turbo's playing. Uh, don't know a lot of the other names, and they haven't like fully been released or whatever. But uh, I was told it's a good game. So Matt so Berkey versus Eric Hicks is back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the rivalry, yeah. if you will, is back. Um, you so guys yeah. some fucking big. Hey, you There's a else? lot of people that uh, I root for you again. You fucked me a lot. I have to root for Eric. He's just too much fun. <laughs> That's <laughs> a good friend for you. Yeah, Told you there'd be people rooting against you, Mark. Shocker. He gets the best of me a lot for sure. He's just fun. Uh, he has a good attitude. He's great. And he's rich, so he needs more money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fuck off, Conrad. He's good for the game. What do you want, man? He is good for the game. You can I'm... beat somebody else, like Turbo. I don't even know what the fuck Turbo is. <laughs> I think it's... I don't know, but that's an awesome name. <laughs> <laughs> Turbo is. Turbo's an it's MTT Turbo grinder. Time. It's Turbo time. Turbo uh, time. Yeah, he's... beat him. I'm he's pretty like sure the opposite he's... of the tortoise. Yeah. He goes yeah. real fast, I go real slow. <laughs> <laughs> you understand. You guys need a podcast. Turbo and the tortoise. <laughs> <laughs> TNT. TNT. That's great, actually. Yeah. That was a good one, Landon. Mm. Um... It's been- yeah. All right. So yeah, Bally's is going to watch Sunday. Garrett will be in the lineups in the future at some point, whenever the games start to get bigger. I mean, if it's not clear, big games are very, very hard to orchestrate. Yeah. Uh, all it takes is one moving piece to collapse and the entire lineup will crumble around. It's a house of cards. This bro. is just something yeah. that's more public nowadays than before. Just because bigger games oh, are less well, prevalent. Before, before <laughs> back in the day when fucking Mighty Mouse and his his team of of idiots were running live at bike, I would get blamed for the lineup falling apart on Sunday somehow, or Rampage because he doesn't want to play a tougher lineup or whatever. Oh, like, Mighty Mouse. Fuck that guy, man. <laughs> fucking slides in my comments like, well, actually. <laughs> Triton Poker ran 56 events and Poker Stars ran 64. And I know that you like to get things right. So I mm-hmm. thought I would just say, it's like, fuck you. Why do you got to be so mean? Uh, I don't know. Cause you're being a dipshit. <laughs> right. That's why. Uh, great. Actually like, fuck off, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Point Dexter. Yeah. Back then, <laughs> back in 2016, there'd be a Facebook live headed by Doug Polk and, and <laughs> Facebook live and fucking mighty mouse blaming all the, the lineup problems on one or two pros that backed out. But now mostly we understand. Just you. Yeah. Mostly just me. Uh, now we or, or Josh Michello, who, uh, <laughs> somehow is still like loyal as fuck to those guys. Uh, but now I think people just understand the inner workings of these politics. Like, you know, if more public three or four guys that are, you know, propping the game up are kind of just like, I don't like the cut of your jib, man. You know, I don't want to play with so-and-so like they, they have all the leverage, you know what I mean? At the end right. of the day, they have all the leverage. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same thing with Garrett. Like he gets to say yes or no to lineups. Like, uh, there's a lot of leverage there. He doesn't have to play. He's doing just fine. Without poker, as best we can tell. So, um, you know, it takes special events to get him out of daddyhood and uh, an early retirement. I think it's better this way, in the sense of like, sure, like the public, that it's public, kind of, yeah, like I agree. the public gets like kind of screwed sometimes, or like, oh man, big game doesn't run. But at the end of the day, a lot of big games run all the time. Yes, and it's better to do it this way than say, oh, like this didn't happen, and like blame somebody when mm-hmm. it's not actually correct. Like, right? Then people speculate and yeah. throw random accusations. It's like, oh, like there he goes yeah. again, like bailing on another high right. stakes game. Like, doesn't it prove that he just can't win? And it's like, no, the game actually broke for this reason. Mm-hmm. I don't want to take yeah false just accountability. So and so's broke, and yeah, it's tough. yeah. And I mean, like, <laughs> hey, this game died. This guy's broke. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, that's well like, that's the big problem. Is like you know, 
<laughs> I've done plenty of fucking reg battling uh, as far as like these televised games go. Like the sure, collapsey game. Sure, like maybe I'm not out here open sitting like, you know, 100, 200 every day taking on all comers, but, uh, and I'm not going to pretend like as if I don't have a very cushy spot. You're, you're not one to turn down an invite no matter what the lineup is. Yeah, like if, if the game's going to run, especially certain stakes, like if 200 foreign plus is going to run, like you just accept tougher lineups because you're happy to play larger Higher. stakes yeah. just like, play the game yeah if my win rate gets cut in a third but i get to play three or four x the stakes that i usually play like that's fine mm -hmm. you know it, it's kind of okay as long as you still uh perceive yourself to be winning what becomes a bigger problem i guess is then a lot of narrative spin off right where it's like oh this guy's just cherry picking line and i'm not even talking about me i'm just saying in general like this tends to be the the conversation is like oh this guy sucks because he cherry picks line it's like well no, maybe he just like earned the ability to cherry pick lineups, you know, like nobody <laughs> Garrett doesn't need poker as much as poker needs Garrett. It's kind it's of part the, of the yeah, go, go I was gonna say it's part of the uh, of the skill, part of the uh, the A game poker, if you will. If, uh, we'll wow. get into that I a little see later. What you did that. But, there is I mean, yeah, well, there's we definitely a skill when it comes to game, game selection, selection and right. like ego not even ego death, but more so like this spot's not worth as much as I want it to be, and I'm okay with sitting it out. Like it's hard to do that. Yeah. Everybody has to look for the bottom line and the positive. It's hard to do that when a lot of people get added that you, you might think are better than you or something like that. Or well, I also think there are a lot of considerations, right? If you're rolled for the current stake, then you're a lot more comfortable reg battling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, honestly, like being completely transparent, the 200, 400 game Sunday, it's like it was going to be an annoying spot for me. Not an uncomfortable one, but an annoying one because I can only get so much cash there. So I know that it was supposed to be 200, 400, 100K min, but I could only get two, maybe three bullets, depending on, uh, you know, my borrowing power and stuff like that, which is a lot still. You know, we're still talking about 750 big blinds, maybe 800 big blinds, or 1,000 big blinds, whatever. But, you know, the game doesn't play that way. Turns into 248 really quickly. Uh, what feels like plenty of shells turns into a pretty empty holster. <laughs> uh, once you lose a couple flips for a few hundred big blinds, you know, it's like it's very much easier to just remain in the shadows, go play good games that are well within driving distance where you have your entire role available to you at all times and just kind of disappear. But that's not that's not the world I want to live in or anybody who's fortunate enough to be in the public space, I don't think, because you know, a lot of it is you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of thing. Like uh, again, I'm speaking for myself mostly, but I'm sure there are a lot of other people that can can uh, agree with this. We're in incredibly privileged positions. This day and age in No Limit Hold'em uh, live arena where so much of the game has like gone private and so much of it is political, to be in a position where you're sought after to play high stakes No Limit Hold'em in relatively soft lineups is one of the greatest... Uh, like uh, almost windfalls that that can fall into your lap. So I mean, you, it, it created a, it started as a skill though. By, sure, it started as for a sure. skill by that human get in that spot. I believe probably true. Um, but with that said, it's still very important to acknowledge that like you don't want to go to such an extreme where you feel like the the talent, so to speak, or the prima donna, where it's just like, no, I'm only going to play when everything is perfect. Yeah. When I have all of my money available, when it's eight fish instead of five, when, you know, we're playing two, four with straddles instead of just like straight two blinds, or it, you, you just, you work with people that are willing to work with you kind of thing. And I think that that's really important to understand as Bally's tries to launch now its third stream, uh, where the first two haven't gone all that well. You know, uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge that the the people who are on the front lines, the Waynes of the world that are trying to put this together, they're doing their damnedest and they're doing it with limited resources, right? Like at the end of the day, uh, and this isn't a shot against anybody, but like, you know, this is almost two years in the making now um, between Live at the Bike, between them buying Live at the Bike, relaunching that stream and then launching Live at the Tropicana. We have basically a two-year sample size of seeing what Bally can put out as a product. And it's very clear they're just not putting much resource into it, right? Yeah. They well, gave person a bunch of money, but like they don't give a lot of money to marketing. I mean, bro, there was a fucking... <laughs> Guapo, you, you got that like, a tweet, <laughs> tweet available? Like 
not only was this tweet completely premature because clearly the lineup wasn't solidified. Yeah. The lineup collapsed within 12 hours of this tweet. But like this Photoshop is something that Conrad could have made in seventh grade. <laughs> I'm trying to find. It. I'm trying to find it right now. I, I probably got it. deleted. Honestly, yeah, probably deleted. I, I hope it did. I would imagine they deleted it, but it yeah. was like it's not it me. was Garrett fucking Duncan on Berkey. But yeah, it was, it it was, was like, like yeah, it was like some NBA poster from the '90s where like I'm like my head is like superimposed onto Steve Nash <laughs> getting dunked on by like Latrell Sprewell that has Garrett's face on it. It's just like oh my god, like. Get a fucking marketing team. You're like Bally is a big goddamn corporation. You're telling me they don't have a single graphic marketing <laughs> arm <laughs> that can like put together a better graphic or better message tweet. You know what I mean? It's Where's like, the graphics guy? Oh uh, yeah, it's just like uh, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm really rooting for Bally uh, Live at Commerce to succeed. Obviously, like having another place to play is so important to me. Always, like I enjoy poker. I want to play as much as possible, but like at the end of the day, it's really hard not to see a company's shortcomings whenever it's like, okay, well, what expect, what, what about this experiment do you expect to be different if you're not putting any money towards player acquisition, if you're not putting any money towards marketing, if you're not putting any money towards the graphic design, the, the uh, clips of the show, how do you the highlight out? reels, how is this, how, what would you deem to be a success? Yeah, you right. just get a hundred shows off a year. Yeah, so how do you grow from this? Like, I don't know. Or, or even uh, forget growth. Like, how do you compete? <laughs> yeah. Right? Because it's like you know, hustler is hustler's humming. They're sure. they're a machine. They they've they've gotten their system down pat, and that's not even to say it's the most optimal. It's not to say that they've reached the pinnacle and like nobody could outperform Hustler. Nobody could do better production wise. Nobody could do better marketing wise. They just have a system. Nobody could do better player acquisition wise. Of course, there's room to improve in all of those areas. Commentary, everything, literally everything. Mm -hmm. The space can be improved upon, but nobody can challenge them because no one's putting the resources towards it. Yeah. So it's like if you're unwilling to, if you just lazily fire up a stream. It's like an, sorry, it's like an engine. Like, Hustler has oil in their engine. Yeah. Other places don't. Like, yeah. It's like, or not say, say other places, but you know what we're talking well, about. I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it, it's a fair comparison. Cause like, uh, I think Lodge is trying to compete, but yeah. again, like they're very small operations. So the amount that they can put towards player acquisition is probably very low. Right. They do seem to do a very good job of marketing. They do a good job of marketing the room period. Yeah. Right. Like the, the special events that they run for the tournament series, like mm -hmm. that's creative. And that's really sharp because it doesn't take any resource to get it going. Yep. You know what I mean? It's it's a different conversation to be had where it's like people in the community are talking about you and it's all organic. You, you know, it's didn't it's, do much for Yeah, it. you just had a you had a harebrained idea. Yeah, right? I think the lads are doing a great job, honestly. Um yeah. it's just like they have they have a problem when it comes to like player acquisition, I would think. Mm -hmm. Because it's just a much smaller place. It's in Austin, Texas, whatever. But yeah, I think that they're doing a really good job all around. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Maybe acquisition is part of it. Acquisition's um, hard, man. Well, I, I say I say maybe just because I think that they are doing a good job of locking up the local, the yeah. local player pool. Like yeah. I would assume most of it plays at the lodge. Mm -hmm. um, your point of like getting people to travel there. Yeah, that's that's gonna be difficult. You, it's hard to compete with Vegas. The it's hard is, to compete with LA. Yeah, in LA, you have all these people that live there. You know? Right. Like, the LA has, everybody but, has money. But Austin isn't like, you know, they're not lacking uh, for for liquidity. <laughs> it's no, a very no, no, wealthy no, no, city. No, no, not lacking for liquidity, but like, it's not as big as LA. Yes, you know? yes, like, yes, there's yes. There's just of more course. to draw from in, when you go to LA or California, just in general. Yeah, 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 a absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Um and yeah, again, whatever, like I'm, I'm curious and excited to see how this plays out from everything I've seen. The set is beautiful and that could be the biggest edge that they potentially possess at commerce. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I haven't been there, so I don't know. I'm only going by video, but like, it looks very spacious. It looks very well built out. Uh, so I'm just speculating that this is going to be an asset of theirs. Ho right. Hopefully they leverage that. I mean, you know, they had a couple of tries, you know, I'm pretty sure they'll get this one right. Well, <laughs> you know, you try and try again, then you eventually get it right. Well, <laughs> I don't trust anything until I see it, man. Champions proof, keep the, playing until they get it right. The proof is in the pointing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
quote your girl. <laughs> Thank you, BJ, BJK. Thank you, BJK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to see what it looks like. I think that they, they probably learned from a lot of mistakes over the past in starting these streams. And it probably. Sh I mean, we'll see because yeah. uh, it doesn't just start and stop here either, right? Like, Tropicana is, for all intent and purposes, finished because it's going to get demolished. Yeah. <laughs> so they're also going to be looking for a new venue here in Vegas, I think. And honestly, like, the, the lack of success for the Bally stream here in Vegas is very confusing. Well, it's sort of confusing to me. Um, but I have a, something to say. It's about a right that. market. Yes, I have something to say about that. Good. So they've been running um, this offhanded game, like five ten, oh, the the nuts or whatever. Yeah, absolute nuts or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a guy video sh streaming it from the seat one, right? Yep. No production, no nothing. Right. It's probably my second favorite stream behind Friday Night Poker. Interesting. Like it was like it's just fun. It was just good. It was just like they put nothing into it. Well, Absolutely nothing. Right. This is just on YouTube. This isn't actually on Bally's page, right? Yeah, no, it's just on YouTube, I think. Right. But yeah, like I, I I enjoyed it. I literally enjoyed it. I watched I can't even tell you how many hours of it, which was very surprising for someone that doesn't really, you know, I don't watch that many live streams, but yeah. I loved it. Alan Richardson is, uh, I know he's a big part of that. I used to play with him a lot in Ivy's room. Uh, I'm not sure everybody else that's involved. I know they've been like shopping their, their game around town. They were at the Bellagio during the summer at one point. Um, and I know they do it a couple of nights a week, maybe now on Bally's. But yeah, uh, it's, it's tough to see what the end game is with a stream like that. Like it makes sense because it, it captures a, a lower stake audience, mm -hmm. which is nice. It makes sense because... When you go the full production route, like a full blown five hour Bally's stream, mm -hmm. and you're running like two five or five ten, it's tough. It's tough because it's, it's tough more, to capture it's, that it's audience. It's more money to put in the fucking production than it's on exactly. the table. Yeah, it, it's that, and it's also just like you're talking, you're trying to capture the same audience that <laughs> would tune in for one hundred, two hundred, mm -hmm. and convince them that watching one twentieth of the stakes is just as interesting. Entertaining, mm -hmm. right? And it's not that it's not doable. It certainly is. But you really have to put a lot of effort and resource into player development, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, again, like, all of this, in my opinion, just boils down to having some sort of vision and executing on it. And my biggest concern is that, especially with corporations involved, it just keeps... The, the buck just keeps getting passed down and down and down and down until you're at low-level management where they're just like, I'm just trying to get butts in the seat. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like, you can't put that much pressure on the game runner or even somebody beneath him because it's it's too much like he's just happy to get soft commits yeah right like you have to have somebody with vision in middle to upper management that's like okay what we see happening is going the old live at the bike model where we have three days of low stakes and we really develop uh four or five characters in this five ten ish player pool that could potentially become rising star, because like, now they have a place to graduate to. Yeah. You have the weekend game that's high stakes. And like, what an amazing turn of events when Art Papazian goes from grinding 5'10 for three or four years to now suddenly sitting with Garrett in the big game on Fridays. You know what I mean? Like, that's a story that you can market. Building characters huge, right. man. But again, you need all of these things well developed. You need the marketing arm. You need the, the player resource arm, the player development arm. You need people who are dedicated to these, to these outcomes, you know, and have some sort of vision that they're executing on. My ultimate fear is that when it comes to most of these stream houses, and I think even Hustler, this is true of, they just have a big advantage because Ryan is great at uh, getting new talent. Um, I, I think for most of them, it's just plug and play. They just turn on a switch. They say, fire up a stream. People will watch. Yeah. And they're right. It is true. For though. now, you know. But Until something comes along that's better, but that's so hard. Because like, well, as, kind as of. you just said, somebody has to have vision in middle management to upper management, and that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like we see, we see that turnover. We see that kind of churn all the time in the content space, right? We see it in the vlogs. We see it in the short form content, right? Like a new idea grabs hold. And then everything else becomes old hat, right? Like, I think only vlogs have managed to be longstanding in the content space for 15 plus years. And it's because there's a clear attachment to human interest stories, right? Like, you just get locked into the person. It's, it's their own version of player development. Um, but 
the rest of content has all shifted heavily from, you know, it used to be 15 minute long Don Mazzetti bits about lifting weights and, you know, broing out in the gym and everything else to now being 60 second shorts of the same thing. That's, that's a clear trajectory change, yeah. you know? And I, I think the same will happen. That's why when you mentioned like the absolute nuts, it's like, yeah, it's long form content, but you could literally consume each hand individually if you wanted to, right? Mm-hmm. Cause it's just a POV type yeah. of of thing yeah right? it's, it's i don't i i really enjoy it i can't figure out why either and i actually like i kind of the hot girls no they have a lot of hot girls no the only one that was on there that i mean there was one girl on when i saw it but like anyway um <laughs> it was it's more like the Sorry, ca- your girlfriend's watching my bed <laughs> no it's um the character is more like it, i don't know why like there was this guy in fucking seat five that's just yelling every hand but like in a fun way like he was kind of annoying but like he has he's just that that's who he was that's his character you mean here no it wasn't here <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i don't know it, it seems like they could have something if they could keep a little bit better production and yeah i think that that stream can grow yeah yeah i agree all right well, that turned into a longer tangent but uh i am glad we did it I, it's nice to hear conrad's voice every now and again you know he kid actually took a stance on something it's beautiful uh so we got a lot of other stuff to talk about today obviously the big conversation is going to be this maurice hawkins interview yesterday um a lot to say on that uh i'm gonna i'm gonna lead by biting my tongue uh i'd like to hear a lot about uh what your guys's take on this is because i think there's a very strong chance that like maybe i just see it differently and that's just very reasonable but uh to catch everybody up on what happened a few days ago maurice chopped the cherokee main and for anybody who's unfamiliar uh he's had a lot of very public um let's call it disputes whenever it comes to owing money in the past uh including one that is still continually being brought up to this day by Randy Garcia. Uh, he's been posting every day since Maurice chopped this main event for around a quarter million or so. Uh, and he's been basically exposing the fact that Maurice owes him a lot of money. So to catch everybody up, last year, no, 2022, right before the World Series, Chad Holloway wrote an article on Poker News and it largely detailed... Um, Everything that happened uh, up until that point with with uh, the the issue with his backer, right? So the backer in question again is Randy Garcia. Randy ev- uh, effectively started calling him out around this time in 2022, demanding to get paid back. Uh, eventually, Randy had sued. Um, let's see, he took the he took the issue to the circuit court of the 15th judicial circuit court in Palm Beach County, Florida. Uh there's a case number and he was awarded a settlement of $115,828. And to give context, Maurice didn't even show up. So, um basically, he sued Maurice for money owed from uh backing wins as well as money that Maurice had borrowed from him. Now, if you watched yesterday's interview with Cairo, you probably saw an attempt to, you know, get Maurice to answer some t- tough questions. And I want to give a little bit of context because the whole reason we started speaking about this was because Tiffany Michelle did an interview after the chop and it was very celebratory of, of Maurice, right? It was very much leaning into he's the dude, uh, bro just wins, like he's a killer on tour everybody should fear this man, you know, like really leaning hard into the, the hero arc for Maurice and through no fault of her own, Tiffany's obviously just unaware of Maurice's checkered past. Right. So it felt very tone deaf to me as a member of the community and somebody who has a microphone to promote something like this in any sort of capacity, whenever we just know this guy owes six figures to at least one person on record. Right. Um, and look. right, it's, it's a bad look. And on top of that, uh, there are other people that have confided in me that Maurice owes them quite a bit of money too. Now in the interview with Cairo yesterday, it was kind of like positioned of like, well, Berkey called you out and said that, you know, you owe all these people. What do you have to say about that in response? Yada, yada, yada. And the context that's missed there is victims don't always want to be public about this type of stuff. There's a lot of shame and embarrassment around it. There are a lot of other reasons uh, 
within the framework of their livelihood, whether it's their family, their job, their career, uh, their standing in a community, whatever, that they don't want to be in the public as somebody who's been rolled for some amount of money by, for all intent and purposes, a thief. Uh, and that's the case with the people that have confided in me. It's like, it's a large amount of money, yes, but to them, they're pr relatively wealthy and they don't care enough to, to hunt down and try to squeeze blood out of a turnip. And they don't want to be looked at in the community as someone that gave a bunch of money to somebody. Right. And uh, the recreational players mm -hmm. that so are that are trying to have a good time and enjoy poker for what it is. They don't need the money. And they unfortunately trusted the wrong individual. And it led to him stealing for all intent and purposes. Now, he was very careful to say that he doesn't owe any backers money. First of all, that's untrue. As we can see with the settlement between him and Garcia. Now, he claims that uh, he only owes Garcia 20000 and that he's not going to pay him because the man disrespected him. That's not how that works. That's not how that works. <laughs> also, from what I understood, uh, like the 20000 was like a settlement. Like, from what I was getting. Gathering. It was prior to him suing, I believe. Okay. I think he offered Maurice a way out. Yeah. Where he said, like, look, just give me 20 k right. and I will, like... I'll take 20% of what you owe or 18% or of what you owe at this point. I'll take something over nothing. And Maurice told him to fuck off. And uh, so he sued him and he won. That's really fucking important to recognize here is that he sued him and he won. There's no right. In a court of law, the <laughs> court of law said, you owe this money. Right. So speculation be gone. And not only that, but Maurice <laughs> didn't even bother to show to defend himself so for everybody who's saying like oh you should have maurice on to tell his side and you should have uh you know randy on to tell his side and then you should just like two side this story it's like what about uh, the court order what about let, that side? let me let me get something out of the way here really quickly so i can temper expectations we are in no capacity the people's court we're not Jerry Springer. <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> we're, we're, we're only friend, friend court. court. We're only friend court. And Wait, we these can't guys, have them on for friend court? They're not friends. They are not. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're not yeah. these things. Have them on for and, and more importantly, like at no point do we believe ourselves to be journalists or news outlets. Yeah. All we are are players within the community, much like all of you at home who are watching, that are giving our informed opinions on things that are happening. So if at the end of the day... I'm stone wrong and Maurice owes absolutely nobody, then I will for sure owe him an apology. But the reason why I'm willing to speak out on behalf of these people who have entrusted privilege and information with me is because I trust them implicitly and I know the value of my, my word in this community. So I know the risk I'm taking whenever I come public and say Maurice owes multiple people outside of this settlement. And when he says name names, I don't have the privilege to do that. But I do have the privilege to say, you can trust me that I trust the sources that are telling me he owes, right? I'm not saying this lightly. I wouldn't just have like Why some random stranger slide in my DMs and be like, Maurice owes me thousands of dollars and then come and run to the podcast and say, hey, uh, John Smith 6769 <laughs> slid in my DMs and said, you owe him. What do you got to say about that? Like, that's not what's happening here. Right? Like these are very well known faces within the the tournament community that have been stolen from. Can I and, play devil's advocate real quick? Sure. Is this <laughs> is this money that was uh was lent outside of poker, like hey, this is a personal loan? Because I know Maurice made it a point to say that as far right. as actual backing goes for poker, like there is no one that's gonna be able to call me out. So I'm just wondering if this is like a personal loan. Well, or someone did and then they took in the court. Right. And well, then there's it, makeup tax. It's a mix. <laughs> uh, so it seems like it's a mix. It seems like he gets people in positions uh, where he owes them a small amount of money. And then he keeps leveraging that to try to get more, basically. Um, you know, a lot of like Tinder Swindler stuff where it's like, oh yeah, 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 I'm gonna get you back that 5K you loaned me. I just need to get put into this main event kind of thing. Let's work out some sort of deal. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes they create a makeup deal. Sometimes it's a free, who knows? Like he very clearly in that interview said he's done bad business deals. Like he's given people bad business deals. And or you know, that he's been a part of a bad business. deal. Well, he, meaning he maybe I, I think what he's, what he specifically said is that people say they'll put him in something 
and front him the money and then don't show up with the rest of the money so he keeps some portion of it be okay, as that, like a tax. Yeah, that I definitely do remember. <laughs> yeah, where he's just like, he, and he goes, that's just business. It's like, what business are you fucking running <laughs> where you think that you can just steal from people and like rationalize it away right. based off of how you feel like you were treated? So from my vantage point, that, that's just laying out all the facts. Like that, that's the only thing I wanted to get out of, out of the way first and foremost, and now I can stop speaking. Uh, what I want to hear from you guys is what did you think about the Cairo interview yesterday? What did you think about poker.org kind of platforming it and being the distribution of said interview whenever, uh, you know, it finally goes public? I thought they were a news outlet and then it looks like they kind of, they're trying to be everything all in one. Like I trust them. So hearing that this was the interview and the way it was taken, just known off of community stuff prior, it seemed tone deaf. Does that make sense? Yeah. And like, it's not a lot of slight, but it's like, I'm pretty sure this guy owes a lot of people money and it makes it seem like he's like kind of chill. That's not great. I'm not happy about it at all. Go on. <laughs> I'm not happy about the whole situation. Conrad's mad. I am. Trying I'm to make you mad. I'm, you're mad. I'm very annoyed more like, and it's not, and Maurice is at the bottom of that list. That's the funny part. It's not even Maurice. It's like, first off, why are we platforming this? Like if, and if you are platforming this, why aren't you going in with like, with research, with a direct line of questioning. You're not doing this to make friends. Like you're doing this to get information out there. Right. You feel so, like it was like too casual too. It, 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 was it, wasn't nothing. A, it wasn't a hard hitting interview. It was nothing. It, it was, hey, people say you owe money in the tw in Twitter, on Twitter. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there was nothing that was, like you can literally type in the man's name on Google and just fucking, you can get court cases, you can get tweets, you can get everything. <laughs> And mm -hmm. that's where you, bring, you can bring that up, the line of questioning. So when you say you're going to do something that somebody else didn't do, and then you come in empty-handed and it's like, uh, it's pretty fucking stupid to me. I, 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 I was actually very annoyed about but it. But that sounds like he's coming from an accusatory standpoint. Like, it's not, I don't know that it's his job to, like, really call him out or... So then don't do the interview. So I agree, I with, I I agree that, with both of you. Yeah, Go I don't on. know that that's Continue, fair. Guapo. Yeah. I thought it was nice to see a different perspective. Um... It was interesting to see Maurice's side. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with everything that he said. Um, but again, I don't know all of the ins and outs, but I, I liked seeing both sides. Um, so I, I was okay with it. When you say seeing both sides, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Like so poker, there have been poker media outlets or whatever you want to call them that um, have done stories on this before. Like I've already known about Maurice just from the things that I've seen on Twitter that I've seen through either poker news or whatever other outlet, if you want to call it media outlet, news outlet. Um, so a picture has already been painted for me. I like that you have the poker.org uh, hoodie on right now. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so, so a picture's already been painted for me, right? Um, but I've never heard Maurice address any of this. You know, I've heard from the people that are accusing him and the people that have spent time to, to write articles about it. So I think it's okay in my opinion, for these same sources to at least, I don't want to say give this guy a platform. I, I don't know what other words to use, but it, it, I think it's okay to see the other side. That's I think fine. it's okay so, to see what Maurice has to say about these things. So that's fine. That's cool and all. We want to hear what he says, right? But at the same time, when he uses language to say that basically um, people want to hold down the black guy and oppressing and all this bullshit. It's like, all right, well, you're the interviewer here. You have to push back on this. Like, I, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, there's, you, you have to have a line of question and then you have to stop the bullshit. Like, I, you can't just let somebody ramble on about like how the world's against them when it's obviously not like that. When it, all it takes is a quick Google yeah, search you just, usually, to figure something out. Right, when you're, when you're doing interviews like that, you need to have good follow-up questions. Yeah, and, sure. or, or just like, yeah, I guess it's just follow-up questions. Just, just like, mm -hmm. like well, the oppression and the, right. like the black, keep the black man down, like that shit was, had me fucking off the rails. Cause it's like, get the fuck out of here. Like, I, all you have to do is fucking Google. That's there were, it. There, there was one thing that he said that I thought may have been a little bit, um, I thought it might have been a reach. He he equated something to uh, Ray Lewis, um, like yeah. when he went, when he won the Super Bowl. Yeah, and that you know they're celebrating, and and somebody comes up to interview him. Like, is it really in good taste that at this moment in this person's career to be like, hey, so let's talk about um, that that murder trial thing that you you know that you were accused of. Um, 
but there is a time difference, right? Like, well, they also did do that. Well, no, for I'm sure. Just, yeah. <laughs> like, if you watch, if, if you go back and watch when they went to the Super Bowl, watch media row leading up to the Super Bowl for the entire week. The entire conversation was Ray Lewis, Lewis's murder trial, right? So it's like, yeah, you have to address the elephant in the room. That's the point of the interview. I I agree with both of you for what it's worth. Um, I I think what Guapo is saying is very true. We were all in this silo where we're only hearing from the accuser standpoint. And granted, he's coming with fucking receipts, man. Like he has a full judgment or settlement against this guy and it's very public. So I, I get why the community latched onto that and, you know, said, Maurice, you're a bad dude because not only is he not acknowledging the debt, but he's also like trying to prop himself up as this killer poker player who has all the money and is just crushing it and doesn't have any debt. So I agree with you in the sense, Guapo, that uh, it's nice to, to have him speak and in a lot of ways, self-report, right? Like he contradicted himself numerous yeah. times throughout that interview. So that's always good to get on record. But I think, I think Conrad's point is incredibly valid and, and worth tugging at in the sense that this wasn't just a random one-off podcast by Cairo. If, if this were just hosted on Cairo's channel and he did a podcast where he had interviews like this, no one would have cared. No one would have been bothered by this at all. I mean, I still would have like rolled my eyes at Maurice trying to paint himself as the victim, but I also probably wouldn't have even watched the interview. The same as I haven't watched the other interview that he did with another group of people that I'm not familiar with, right? The issue becomes whenever, uh, when an accredited source like Poker News, or sorry, Poker Org, in this instance, decides to platform it, right? Because now it's not Cairo's platform, it's Cairo leveraging Poker Org's platform to give a soft interview. And I think, that's, I, I think that's where Conrad's beef is really important. And for what it's worth, like, I don't, I don't, I, f- I feel like maybe I was a little bit too critical initially of Tiffany's interview of, of Maurice because it felt tone deaf to me because I was holding Poker Org to a standard of being news and being journalists. But there's just a good chance that's not what they're trying to be, right? Like, when people call us fake news and try to hold us to that standard of journalism, you know, there was a big back and forth that we had with Norman Chad, who I have a lot of respect for. And I, I love Norman to death. He was incredibly critical of us saying that, like, you know, we didn't always both side stories and that we weren't taking real journalistic integrity whenever we were leading with things. And my immediate answer was, we're not journalists. We're not the news. That's not my background. I don't need to both side things because I don't offer either side the platform, right? It's just my personal commentary my personal opinion of what's happening and we just kind of left it agreeing to disagree but with poker org poker news these are actual media outlets that are for hire right they will market and do media for your events and everything else so in my brain in my brain it was well this is an accredited news source now that's platforming a content creator to give an interview where conrad's point is very valid None of the follow-up questions were, well, actually, there's a settlement against you. Can you speak on that? You know what I mean? Like, Cairo clearly went into that interview as blindly as Tiffany went into hers. Yeah. And so whenever, whenever Maurice is just spewing off bullshit and spinning it such that, like, he used my name like 18 times in the interview. And this is, this is the thing. Like, this is what Vertucci does, too where you create an enemy out of the person who's just willing to speak out and speak up on the betterment of the community, right? Like, why are we talking about this? I'm talking about this because we will get 10,000 views on this video. And of those 10,000 viewers, some of them will play a circuit event with Maurice and he will ask some of them for money. And I'm giving you guys a clear warning to not give it to him, Mm -hmm. right? That's my duty as a longstanding member of the community who has a microphone, in my opinion. And I could be dead wrong and you can crucify me for it. I don't care. That's the business I'm going to stand on. You know what I mean? But whenever it's propped up in a way where... Th- so, so, so Poker Org like, replied to my eye roll tweet of the interview and said like he'll come on OnlyFriends or something. Or, or, or sorry, they, they said like we trust Cairo to get uh, all the answers and ask all the questions or whatever. And I just replied with this is lazy. And the word I left off was, this is lazy reporting, right? That was what I was implying, is that this is lazy reporting 
to take somebody and this is no slight against Cairo. Again, if Cairo were just hosting a podcast and he had Maurice on, let him talk his shit. Let him lean into whatever narrative he wants. If if Cairo's the host thinks that it'll get the most clicks, if he turns this into a Matt Berkey versus Maurice Hawkins thing, do it. That's on you, man. You know, that's that's your platform you're trying to grow. Good on you. Do your thing. If you decide that you want to go the racist angle and like pull out that narrative and lead with the title, black man with money held down in poker community, do it. Fucking do it. That's great. Like you're the content creator. Like you will have to answer to your community and your audience as the creator and platform. But when you're doing it on behalf of poker org and poker org says, well, we trusted Cairo to do this thing. It's like, okay, well now you're also held accountable for all of the narratives and messaging that Maurice spouted out to the community. And in my opinion, that becomes very lazy reporting. Because it's under the veil of being like a news type of investigation sort of thing. It got 400,000 clicks on Twitter coming from the Pokorg account. How many do you think it would have got if Cairo posted it solo and it was on his YouTube? Okay, that's fair. One one hundredth, right? When you amplify things, you have a certain level of responsibility to them. And if you want to say that you're not trying to be a news source, you're trying to be more of a social media platform, you're trying to be more TMZ than you are trying to be 60 Minutes, that's fine. Pick a lane. But pick that lane, yes. We need to know that as the consuming community. Like the what is poker world. And you have that narrative and you yeah, stick with and, it. And I'm coming from a place where it's like, I'm on their integrity council. You know <laughs> what I mean? And it's like... At least you guys do something over there. Do we? I don't know. Because, Let's you know, so. not that this should be <laughs> ran by me, but like, I, I, I was very outspoken the first time that the interview was done. And then... I'm outspoken again now whenever I think they've doubled down on a really bad take. He's back again. Right. And now the third thing they're going to do is platform Randy Garcia to tell his side of the story. And it's like, uh, that's not how you two side something. You don't, you don't do a lazy interview with the person who's taking advantage of everybody and let him try to clear his name. And then when you get a ton of public blowback, say, oh, my bad, my bad. Let's hear from the other side. Right? We've already heard from, like, this is the thing. Everyone's like, have Maurice on, have Maurice on. It's like, fuck no. Absolutely <laughs> not. I'm not going to get bullied on my show to answer a bunch of questions that I clearly am not privileged enough to answer. Like, I can't speak on behalf of the people he's taking advantage of any further than just acknowledging that it happened, number one. Number two, I'm not going to have a bad faith debate publicly, live, for everyone to hear while he just continually goalpost moves and shifts things, right? And I'm certainly not going to have him and Randy on in the same room and try to moderate it. Like as if this is Jerry Springer or the people's court. Like that just doesn't amount to anything ever. So I have no interest in both sides in this story. I have only the interest in providing like warnings to the community from my vantage point as somebody who's been around for 20 years and has seen this play out time and time and time again, if this man has a settlement against him for 120000 you can guarantee it's magnitudes larger that he owes that isn't getting settled in court, right? And, you know, the last point, if he hasn't already been totally discredited enough, first of all, you said my name 16 times and you claim you don't know who I am. <laughs> I call. <laughs> But secondly, you also claimed you profit $600,000 a year. Oh, Rob, I don't know if you have that Hendon mob handy. But looking back over, I think, the last eight years, Maurice has actually never even cashed for $600,000. So this is 2023 all the way back to 2011, which looks like the beginning of his career because he cashed for 45 k that year. So we're talking 12, 13 years. I mean, if you never pay your backers, that's all profit, so. Not true. <laughs> well, buy ins too, right? You still have to buy in and lose, I know, bro. I know. It's a joke. So, 13 years, he has about 5 million in turn tournament or earnings. Total. And none of them equate to $600,000. He, right. he never had a 600K. Okay, sorry. This goes way back further. So, 70, 18 years. This goes deeper. 18 years. So, he basically has like an 18 to 20 year long career, has about the same amount of Hendon Mob earnings as me. But his biggest year is 577000 which was last year, which obviously is 
not counting his buying cost, right? Right. So if he's the best in the world, like they celebrate him to be, his ROI is 50%. He profited 300K last year and he had backers. So how much did he really take home? Right. Right? Like, cut the bullshit, man. And, and, and here's the thing. Like, I don't fucking care. Like, scammers exist everywhere. Maurice Hawkins means nothing to me. But every time that he wins something and no one gets paid back, yeah, we're going to fucking talk about it. Because it's going to be a warning in the future to not do business with this guy moving forward, right? Same thing with Zeno. Like, I like Zeno a lot, but all signs are pointing to him possibly having done something shady. My simple takeaway from that was, hey, here's the facts. Here's the police report. Here's what one party is claiming. Here's what the other party is claiming. Be careful if you Somehow do business with this, these like, people. Somehow this turns into you speculating. Right. It's like, I'm not speculating shit. I'm just saying don't do business with people that are constantly in, <laughs> you know, other people's mouths for owing. Yeah. It's just that simple, man. If you hear from a dozen people that one person owes, they fucking owe. It's not like you have anything to gain much from doing things along these nothing. lines, too. Literally nothing. It's everything to lose and nothing to gain. But, like, like it's- I also understand that, you know, for, for, for what this community is, if no, one, if no one gets their hands dirty and nobody's willing to speak out against other people that are doing wrong shit, it's no longer zero sum. And it's not even close to no longer zero sum. It's so negative sum because the defectors make so fucking much on the fringes by just being bad people you know it's all the cheating the lying the stealing there's so much more money to be made there than there is in any one human being's win rate you know what i mean like the best of the best in this world or in this in this in this space are not going to outperform the best cheater the best th- thief you know what i mean like they're making variants free money <laughs> The only variance is that somebody gets on a mic and calls them fucking out for it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, hey, that's my civil duty. I'm happy to perform it. And it is what it is. Like, it's just, uh, I- I'm glad to see that the interview got a lot of pushback. Like, when I watched it, and, you know, maybe you guys can speak a little bit to this. When I watched it, I was just like, Jesus Christ. Like, people are going to believe this nonsense, and this is going to turn into another... Like, it, it had a slant to it where it's like, the, impl- the, underly- the undertone of it all was that Berkey's racist. That's why he's calling me out. And it's like, bro, we can't go down this road where if somebody steals, and you mentioned that they steal, that suddenly... Like, he used the word oppression as much as he used my name. And it's like, scumbag is not an oppressive word it's it's an adjective for someone who steals right you know it's just like it has nothing to do with race color or creed it it simply has to do with your actions and it's a reflection thereof so i don't know man i I mean honestly like we're all better for this stuff having getting gotten aired out like this publicly um but i i think it's unfortunate that like poker.org took took such a bath in all of this because it just seems like such a miscalculation. Like uh, it feels such like they're a damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. Like I don't want I don't want us to sound like we're we're upset when they don't ask the tough questions, and now when they do, well, we're not happy with that. But either. they did it though. That's, that was, that's also, the, that's the problem. I, I wasn't upset that they didn't ask the tough questions. Like go back to the Tiffany interview. I didn't care that she didn't ask him about owing money. Yeah, no. I cared that she celebrated him being so fucking good. Honestly, the interview was really good, though. It was, it was, it's, it's great entertainment. She put, she put together a phenomenal piece of, of entertainment. Course, of course. He, he lends himself to being the anti-hero yeah. really well, yeah. and that's a great thread to pull at. We need more of that in poker. Like People are just willing to be arrogant and over the top, and you know, reporters or whatever that are willing to lean into that narrative. It's great. It's just, you know, it was, it was a little out of pocket yeah. whenever it's Maurice. Agreed. That's all. No, that's it. That's right. it. I didn't care that she she doesn't have to air his dirty laundry. That's not her job. Yeah. Right? So that's what I was saying the other day. Like, I don't think it is her job. But then right. again, just be avoided. Right. Right. So it's like, I, I think maybe that was miscommunicated. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't implying that they should do a follow-up interview where they ask Maurice the tough questions. Nobody needs to ask anything. He has a fucking settlement against him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's no question to ask. It's right. been asked and answered by a court of law. Mm-hmm. There's nothing left to ask. Um, when that comes to co- the, the court, um, 
if he doesn't show up, isn't it just like whatever he's at being asked is settled for? Yes, I, like, I believe so. That's what I think. Like, I, I think it's just auto ruled against. Yeah, I'm exactly. not positive, but I, I think that they settle against him. That's what that's what my understanding was, but I'm not sure. Right, but you know, yeah, you you would assume if you don't show up, you don't have much of a case. Yeah, no. Of uh, I mean, if you know that you're just going to be settled against yeah. instantly. Um, then yeah, you probably don't have much of a case. And like, right. look, the internet's done its thing since then. There's a ton of dirty laundry being aired about Maurice. I don't care to get my hands dirty with that shit. I don't care what properties he has a lien against. I don't care what what uh you know home he got evicted from and what landlord's suing him for back rent or anything along those lines. But it's out there. Public record is public record. You know, you can't just do all this shit and expect to get away with it and have nobody say anything. Uh, the last thing I, I want to touch on before we move on from this is Chad Holloway put something out that I think is really important to see how this progresses moving forward. And basically it's that gambling winnings can be, uh, can, can, can be captured by somebody with a settlement. They can put a lien against his uh, income, right? So I don't know if Randy is familiar with this at all, uh, but like this is what... Um, did the possible. Yeah, this, this is what... Uh, Veronica. Veronica, she has a settlement in three states versus Possel, where if he wins any money in those states, it immediately gets garnished. The only reason why she didn't get the money in Mississippi just is a because, like, day too late. Yeah. Yeah, just a day too late. But if, uh, if you know, Randy's sharp on this, he'll get this cleared in Nevada and just take away Maurice's ability to earn in the WSOP, which mm -hmm. is pretty huge. And also, it's it'll be very interesting to see if he does do that and it becomes public if Maurice still plays because at that point you can almost guarantee he's overselling because the only reason to play, play would, be. would be to just pocket the money, right? Um, so yeah, just be careful out there. That's that's literally the purpose of this segment. It's a be cautionary who, tale. Yeah, be careful who you're doing business with. It, it's it's that simple. It's like a fable. For, L, for LOLs, the guy that got second in the tournament or third, whatever, chopped it with them. Yeah. He's like, because you know how Maurice said that there was a bunch of people saying the N-word at the final table and stuff like oh, that. Oh, I didn't hear that part. Oh, uh, yeah. He said something like people in the, the crowd or whatever. He's like, none of that shit happened. He's, yeah. just, <laughs> he's like, you could ask four other people that were there. None of that shit happened. Yeah. Look, I'm not trying to downplay racism. I'm very well aware that ah, it exists. It happens. And I'm sure that Maurice, more than anybody, especially being very outspoken, gets more than his fair share of it and for that i'm sorry and but, living in the south right <laughs> right it's like you know i totally empathetic to that and you know it's a horrible horrible thing but also don't lie on it yeah right like don't don't play into it so that you know you take on the victim complex yeah when, nobody makes when more you're clearly guilty of something nobody makes more race jokes about race than me like it's being black and brown whatever and it's like you doing it like in that type of form is so Bad taste. Just bad taste. Well, it's scary because you start Horrible. to weaponize something that, yeah. like, we are already walking... Like, good people... Walking on eggshells. ...want to walk on eggshells. We want to do right by any inequalities that may exist. Mm -hmm. And when you take advantage of that, it's the boy who cried, cried wolf. You know what I mean? Like, you just create this this hesitancy then from, from like, people who truly want to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a shitty, shitty outcome for everyone involved. Agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, be careful what you do business with or else you'll end up in the muck. So, uh, yeah. to avoid that, let's talk about somebody else who's in the muck. The court of order. Mark. I just got thrown this or something. Yeah. Like right, right at well, you. One of you can read the hand history. It could be Lamana. Could be me. I don't know what it is. Sure. I was like, well, why don't we just throw it to this? Okay, let's throw it to this. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what do you need me for? Wait, go back to the start. We got our... Uh, We're on the turn. <laughs> we, got our good, we got our good friend Chi, who you might know from the uh, study groups in our Discord. Uh, you know, sometimes you lead a study group and you're still in the muck. So this hand comes up where um, it's a 5-10 it's, uh, game, and uh, we have a raise from the hijack, and the cutoff is going to go ahead and... Uh, so we raise the 40, cut off makes it 130 for the three bet. Uh, folds to Chi in the big blind with King Queen of Hearts. He goes for the cold four bet to 300. There are uh, about 3,100 effective here. Uh, original opener folds and the three better in the cutoff calls. We get a flop of Jack of Hearts, Five of Hearts, Three of Clubs. Uh, and so <clears throat> Chi goes with a, 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 a little bit bigger bet here he goes with uh, about 
B66, which is 66% of the pot, 425 into uh, 645, and is met with a call. The turn is the four of diamonds. He goes to uh, another lead uh, for 900, which is about B60, and uh, is met with another call. And the river is the deuce of spades, putting a one-liner on there, and ace or six makes a straight. And he's left with king high, and he goes for it. He has about 40% pot, and he jams for uh, just shy of 1,500 into 3,300, and he is called. We didn't. He didn't tell us what uh, what the hand was, but he did not win the hand. And obviously. he beat ten and hearts. No, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the hero call with ten yeah. high, and he wins. No, no. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. So he was. His main concern was um, the turn where, you know. Okay, so like I mean. He, he three bets pre with the, or four bets, sorry, uh, cold four bets with the king, queen of hearts, um, which I think probably mixes. Okay, before and, we go to wizard, like, let's, yeah, yeah. let's talk about this. Right. So, um, so he, his main concern was uh, the turn where, you know, he cold four bets get called, leads the flop, gets called, and now he's, the, the pot is growing and he has king high and, you know, he felt like, well, if I just check, if I check, I, I have so much equity, I don't want to like, but I still only have king high. The check calling felt bad. <clears throat> okay, so from my perspective, uh, what makes this a muck hand is not having very well fleshed out four bet pot strategies. Um, and I think that the turn spot amplifies that. But in my opinion, we probably got flop wrong here um we it, it's a pretty dry board jack four three two hearts you're not jack going five, three, yeah. sorry jack five three two hearts uh so you're not going to be against <clears throat> uh a ton of equity in the flat callers range especially when you're holding king, king queen of hearts well yeah I of mean, course but in but general in, like in the range in general, tight range right. versus tight range uh sure both ranges are going to be a little bit more linear in nature but you're not going to be against a ton, like not a big percentage of imposition's range is hearts. Not a big percentage of your range is hearts. For both ranges, it's going to be a lot of ace high holdings and a lot of pairs. Right. So I think whenever we start to map out what our strategy here is at an SPR of like four, uh, a little bit more, maybe like four and a quarter, um, we need to decide whether we're playing a two or three street game. When we're playing a two street game, we are going to be basically going GO2. Uh, when we're playing a three street game, I think we have the option to either go very small, maybe somewhere between 10% and quarter pot, uh, or just GO3. So geometric sizing for flop, if we go for a two street game, is going to be pot. Right. Uh, geometric size, well, a little bit more. It's, it's probably going to be like 105% pot. Uh, yeah, I'll fix this. I'll fix this. Like ninety two percent for me, so I'll, I'll okay. Yeah, it should I'll be a, it should it. be a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> geometric sizing for uh, three streets is probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of half pot, I believe. Uh, maybe slightly more. Might be like closer to sixty percent. Uh, if both of those sizings are too close as far as being considered large, the other op alternative we have is that we go small here for a range bet, which on this particular texture, I think from a cold four bet range, we definitely have a range bet. It's just a question of do we have a range bet for small or for large, right? Um, if we choose to just range bet small and we think that's accomplishing something, then we can just GO2 on turn. So let's say we go quarter and get called. Now there is like uh, three-ish SPR. I was under the impression that a range bet was always small. Doesn't have to be. Whenever ranges are really tight and you're looking to play a two street game, it can certainly just be big, big. Um, Deeper, yeah, like we've seen in Florida yeah. pots. Yeah, because yeah. your range is already condensed. Like your range is so small, right? So like when you range bet, when you have a huge wide range, then a range bet is, is always small. small always small. It's wide versus wide. You're trying to carry right. those ranges through. Right. But when you both have tight. When it's tight, condensed, and uh, then, right. pretty inelastic to mm -hmm. sizing, you can go large, large. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I think mechanically speaking, the 66% on flop is just too hedgy. 
Uh, now, it might actually turn out that that's... Uh, well, we know it's not 3E because he went 66-60 and then was left with 40. Right. So 3E is probably going to be 40 to 50% somewhere in that neighborhood, which I think is a pretty sound strategy because we can pivot off of it. We can go 40 on flop, and then we can polarize turn, potentially, depending on what it is, or we can also check. And the 4 is a card that I imagine is going to yield a lot more checking from our range due to the amount of ace high floats that our opposition has mm -hmm. the amount of pocket pairs that are pretty inelastic on this card and then also like the pair plus ace highs that are still uh still holding a gut shot i you know when it's all said and done i'm sure he lost to a hand like ace jack of hearts ace ten of hearts something in that neighborhood maybe ace jack of hearts can't, is, it clubs, can't, yeah. is not possible hearts oh sorry sorry yeah but so ace ten of hearts ace ten of hearts maybe right. just ace, ace five three, ace, ace four ace three ace any three of hearts, these hands ace four hearts, doesn't yeah. even have to be hearts right right like no, right, all right. combos of ace five ace four ace three are going to make it to the river right um yeah. so i think what we're going to find here is that this is mostly just going to be a two street game in some capacity whether it's bet check bet or it's just bet all in right if we go two e on flop we can jam this card mm -hmm. because now his ace highs are in hell Right. And even his pair plus ace highs are pretty indifferent. Like ace three, ace four, not going to be pretty pumped. To face pot. To face pot right. all in on the turn, yeah. right? Um, that's my perspective. I haven't looked at this, obviously, but I think I think the, the principle that we want to take away here is understanding a little bit more deeply what our betting structure is in four bet pots and being able to map that uh, across all of the different board types, right? Like some boards, we're gonna we're gonna have a check or maybe mm -hmm. a really small bet, like ten percent, mm -hmm. and then we need to figure out how to play a two street game thereafter, right? A board like this is pretty dry. We have all options available on the table, so uh, I'm curious to see what the wizard has to say. Yeah, so the wizard is busy trying to fix the cutoff range. So okay. like, so Matt, I do have a question. Oh, I'm sure, sorry. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> no, go ahead. Go one question. <laughs> well, okay. If Chi wanted to study the spot, it sounds like the spot he really wants to look into is the turn, right? No. Well, no. So his, Has to his be flop. so his um, so th this kind of payback is off what I was gonna say. So like his concern was like the turn, like uh, check calling with king high felt bad. But like if you have the flop strategy correct, then you're not in that situation. Is that kind of what that that's what right? I'm implying? Right? Yeah. So like it's like yeah, <laughs> if, if you went with like a geo two size on the flop and you just bet pot, you kind of have not, no decision on right, the right. Right. It's just like oh, I just have a lot of equity in king high and I can just. In I need to be and, bluffing something. Right. I can't check call yeah. this hand. This hand is great. I, I put a lot of his hands in hell, and if I get called, I have a lot of equity. Now, mm -hmm. he was dead. Well, not dead, but he was dead-ish. Uh, he texts me the opponent had 6-5 of diamonds. Oh, wow. So he just drills a gut shot. But, uh, I mean, his opponent probably makes a bad float on the flop yeah, for that size. That but for sense. sure, if we 2-E, 6-5 has to be out. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think anyway. But right. what, what are you looking at here, Lando? I am okay. This should be fine. Uh, the solution's been created. So <laughs> flop looks like he's right. It's sixty-seven. Makes a okay. lot of sense to me. Um, you mostly range betting for the big size because your range is so condensed. Mm -hmm. And like, we can, I guess, speculate. Like, if I wanted to like clean it up a little more, like how much is are these hands like nines and stuff, cold fouring tens, like maybe like tens bottom. So like we just go change. I think it's kind of nice to do this sometimes. Oh, I just absolutely roasted it. <laughs> I just absolutely roasted it. That's not good. That's bad. Um, but so you go hijack, open, cut off call, big blind, cold four. If you want to know how to do run the sim, this is how you do it. <laughs> uh, it's jack four three, right? Jack yeah. jack five. Jack five three. Jack of hearts, five of hearts. I was three so close. Clubs. Speed running. So now you click AI solve. You go to the stacks. We said SPR was like four point something, so like two ninety. Hot can be seventy. And now we go to the big blind range and just go wait zero. Like I can just assume that like six five isn't like these hands don't really exist. Tens is probably the bottom. Like sometimes like hold fouring is not really that appealing. Jack's probably like maybe half the time, I guess. And then look something like this seems pretty reasonable. Um, click confirm. And then go to the cutoff. And like I'm assuming that the cutoff is probably just gonna like three bet and then peel ace ten suited, ace jack suited, ace queen suited if they three bet. Yeah, you it. can't you, you can't give it all. It's just how much is he going to three bet pre? Probably exactly. 100, like 100, you know? It's, it's yeah. cut off hijack. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So like ace-king suit is probably not going to jam pre or like do anything else. So we can just maybe sometimes like give 75%. Yeah. Ace is going to trap sometimes I think is good. Being in position, ace-king off seems good like half the time. Yeah. King seems like 
all right, half the time. Like, you don't just want to yeet in 300 and see aces. Right, right, like, yeah. probably a mistake. I don't know why jacks, tens, and nines are so, like, these hands are pure peeling. Yeah, so I just, that's why I think I wanted to do this. Yeah. Like, nines, eights. Pair, I mean, what pair is folding to a cold four? They probably shouldn't, but how, so much do they, how much do they three bet? Right, yeah, yeah, that, so, that I think is very valid. So we just go like fives, uh, maybe uh, bottom. Fives and fours probably aren't even there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I just move it. Five, four suited. I mean, if you have six, five, like give it a quarter, yep. right? The fantastic four is mm -hmm. here. They're there. <laughs> well, you took six, five <laughs> yeah. out. Oh, oh man, that. get that back get, in there. Get the human torch back in there. <laughs> uh, ace, four, ace, five. I don't know how he just knows them like so of well. Of course I do. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I, we, I created this. Uh, King, the suited paint, I'm assuming, is going to mostly just like King Queen's going to call, King Jack's going to call. Yeah. King 10's going to call, Queen. Like, people don't like folding suited paint to the four bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nor I should they. Give, I mean, give the, like half, you know, for like the Queen both Jack. Both ranges like, are going to be pretty linear at this step, I something think. Something like this, right? This seems relatively reasonable that three bets and then calls the four bet. Ace Queen should be folding pre. I apologize really to the people listening to this on uh, one and a half and two X speed. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yeah, I'm stimming. I'm uh, working fast. Yeah. Uh, create solution. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. So I already set up the machine. So what you want to do if you want to look for dynamic sizes is I think you go I think you go here. Nope, I'm not going to do this again. You go to the paint, you go to the little pencil, and you see here for the bet sizes, you want to change it to dynamic. Uh, cut off, you can apply the same strategy, the strategies as big blind. Dynamic, give one size on flop, one raise size, always add all in. Uh, turn off, specify sizes to compare. And then you go to turn, have one bet size, and then river, you can go two bet sizes because maybe you want to have a block and then a pot and then always add all in. So this is how you want to set up the, the dynamic wizard to give you your answer. Dun, 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 dun. So yeah, now we're range betting. We're just range betting big size. Yep. Because we have really good hands right. and yeah. all of our bluffs, so to speak, have either over cards or equity and like a gut shot. You know, like ace four is just like a good hand now. So I, it's just I'm a, a little, pure... I'm a little bit surprised that it's choosing a size that creates such an awkward turn mm -hmm. uh, uh, size for us. But I guess like can, you know, we can add a little two e here. Uh, just I, I to don't, see. I don't think. I mean, it might choose it some of the time, but obviously, if it's just going pure sixty seven, I think it's going to default to that. Yeah. So like now you're, I guess mixing. It mixes. Like you okay. just mix the strategy. Yeah. Uh, king queen mostly going for the smaller size with hearts, mm. just because your hand's really good. Uh, and then King it basically clubs just, a little bit yeah, more. What it, what, it, what it is is that, like, Jax just can't 2E. Right. And that's, like, the biggest... It's kind of brutal that, when you have building, top set. That's basically what it's building the strategy around. It's like, Jax can't 2E, and everything else doesn't suffer from going slightly smaller. So right. we're just going to go 67 and build the strategy around that hand. So 67 is oh. nice. Um, in position, just kind of has appeal with all the draws, has appeal with oh, Jack I'm wrong. X. 6-5 peels purely. Yeah, you have a pair. You can make two pair and stack aces. That's nice. Diamonds, uh, it's cut off, but do diamonds peel? All of them. Okay. Every every single one. Uh, wow. Seven, eight, the only one that calls is hearts, of course. <clears throat> and then six, seven, you have to peel all of them because you're deep enough and have a gutter. Four oh, texture sorry, changes. Sorry. Oh, he had six, five. I'm, I was thinking about the roar. I was thinking about six seven for the gutter. Yeah, but six it seven calls is still a lot. Like it loses. It wins fourteen bigs to call. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense because we don't really have I any was thinking six gutter coverage. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can draw yeah. to the nuts. He just he turns the open ender. Right, right, right. So we could have put him into hell. Ace king, you have to. Uh, Ace king has to call with the heart for him. Sure. And then Jack X has to call, and then flush also have to call. Like his his range that continues actually looks very reasonable. Very um, very easy to to know this range right yeah like i think nine tens and nines with three. a heart call everything else folds yeah. uh you know you fold the hands that just miss like queen ten of spades uh ace ten of spades shit like that you know what i mean you kind of let him play like a decent dish strategy like he gets to kind of make good decisions and you just win because when you have your your bluff like ace queen and right. you just folds ace king no heart like that's great for you yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's just kind of a byproduct of the tightness of the ranges yep Turn is four of diamonds. I'm assuming you don't want to do anything with king, queen of hearts just because like he has ace, 10 of hearts and that's really right. bad for you. Right. Like if this result happens and like you- Oh, you bet it half the time. You can bet sometimes. You can check too. You don't jam it. It looks like jam is a mistake because like if you we quickly look at the jam, we'll see the ace, 10 of hearts. Oh shit. Wow. Oh, fuck me. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, I guess this folds. is why, like, it might, yeah, I would have never thought this folds because you can like draw to the knots. Like right. if they have king, queen, like right. it feels like a- Really Maybe toxic. it's because you're only supposed to be yeeting nut flush draws. It's just over pairs. And then or an like, ace king of no, hearts. And then no, it's too good. Oh, you just jam uh, ace king of diamonds. Mm, it's like okay. a weird mergey bluff where yeah, like yeah. you get stuff to fold, like 
Well, now that we know Ace King of Hearts is folding, but yeah. yeah, maybe that's why, right? You're eating Ace King of Diamonds, so Ace King of, or Ace Ten of Hearts is Ace not Heart. doing as well. Correct. And then you have equity versus stuff, and mm. oh, he's got to call sevens. I mean, that's that's brutal. Um, but yeah, so it looks like you can bet, and you just bet call off. I imagine like your hand too good, hand too good, please. I need one back. I need one back so bad. I mean, it's only thirty five percent pot. Of course, <laughs> you're right. calling. All right, you just bet call. So like, you can just bet okay. call it off. You can check and. Checking's fine too. King, right. This king queen is the only one that bets because you do have equity. Mm -hmm. So then when you bet and get called and the river's an offsuit deuce, right? I th I'm going to assume you'd have to bluff this because what else do you bluff? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's just pure. Yep. Nice. Like, what what else do you have? Right. Everything else everything is a, pair is a straight, straight. It's queens. Like, and I guess yeah. this is kind of why you do bet the turn is like if you bet and get jammed on, you can call off. And if the board texture changes in a way that like an ace falls or a deuce falls, right. you now have a bluff. And then if a king or a queen comes, you've cleaned up your outs a lot. Yep. And you can you can probably jam value for jam. value yep. and, and win, I imagine. Let's yeah, I think I think the way my brain works is this is just like a little bit less of a clean strategy than three E or two E. Gotta jam it. But it makes a lot of sense uh from the standpoint of the turn is the biggest leverage point. So you don't want to reduce the sizing such that you are now two eating the turn, you know? Right. You, you don't want to, you don't want to reduce your size to like 45% pot so that you have a half pot jam on the end or whatever. Yeah. Well, so what we can do is like, we see here that range bet for B67 is worth 43.78. Mm. So now if you want to change that, just remember that number 43.78. Man, I was, I was looking for these numbers the other day and I was just... Just click the ranges button. Bro. Yeah, I couldn't find it. 43.78 goes to 43.4. Four, six. So you lose like a small blind okay. uh, by going 2E only, right. but like ranging 2E. Right, right. I guess just like remove the, remove the check just so it's 100%. Um, so yeah, now it's losing a small blind, right? Okay. Was, like you're losing quote unquote a lot to just like 2E well, range. Kind of. You're losing a small blind. Which yeah, is, but you're losing a small blind in a pot of 70 big blinds. Yeah, it's not that, it's not that much, right? So you're losing like what? <laughs> nothing you're losing very low like, percent of pot share yeah like you make uh, your life easy. less than one percent pot share and you make the, the strategy is pretty simple right like you're just gonna eat equity on the turn yeah and you kind of force him to just like put money in himself like he just has to pile like enough flush draws right so if you if you execute the two e strat uh so you bet 102 get called turns and then four. turns to four and you jam i'm curious what six five does i mean i don't think king queen wants to jam yeah nice yeah just pure checks Ooh, got one back uh, wow fascinating yeah, so you just check and you just like you hope, like you check and check and hope, because uh, jamming is too much. Right. Because like now, I, I guess it's born off of the imposition sizing being small now. What do we do? What, do we, what does he do if we jam? So six five still pure calls. Yeah, six five has to call right. You yeah. Pair. You can beat some stuff. You can make that, a straight. That makes sense. Why we're not jamming then? We don't fold out any equity. Right. Uh, better hands right i mean yeah. you yeah like ace and you, you can't, just get ace king to fold but that's not that big of a win yeah right. and you you block it and like you get ravaged by ace five exactly where it's like i have a gutter and a pair and they're like yeah. i hope you have king queen yep so like jamming it yourself is is really bad so, so if, you don't want to do if that if you check i'm i'm sure the imposition almost purely bets or, or sorry it's strategy is almost always just quarter pot probably, of, probably yeah. very little jamming yeah so quarter pot i mean decent amount of jams with the hands that need the most protection, protection like right. you have queens and you're like ah fuck like a deuce can come like yeah yeah be scared yeah. uh ace is jamming and not intuitive to me but here we are uh yeah and then you're mostly checking back the hands that want to realize or you're just betting small and probably just calling mm. off like you're doing very, you're doing yourself a kind of nice so it's interesting the the small the small bet is actually built around his polar hands it's jacks it's ace jack it's you check back pure at the straight because what are you scared of right uh funny enough like if a heart comes in ace king queen like you're fucked but yeah but there's like two combos of hard draws yeah welcome to yeah, welcome to the gambling and flushes <laughs> right. coming uh yeah, I mean, there's actually a good amount of jams so here. So this is interesting. I'm actually the one in the muck. Chi yeah. played this pretty much perfectly. Yeah, he did. Uh, very, very well wizard approved uh, line here by Chi. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, turns mix and then river. You're all in it. He did good. Yeah, I agree with you that I think uh, the in inclination to check the turn is probably better. Um, because in my opinion, and now that we see that like King Queen doesn't really want to be all in on the turn, Nothing about that hand to me feels like a three street type of betting hand. Uh, so checking, checking comes with the benefit that they can check back is I guess the biggest mm -hmm. takeaway. Right? I have a question. Good. So let's say we change the river in this situation to a 
a uh, seven, a brick, or sorry, yeah, like an a eight, brick. Yeah. an eight. Let's say an eight. So we bet call. We bet I think sixty-seven still, on flop. I think he's still going to yeet it. Okay, yeah, let's... I just I feel like it puts us in such a bad situation where you're eating it for fifty percent pot. I think I would check because yeah, we have bad yeah. cards. And we have the king, queen of hearts. Like We yeah. have the cards that we want them to have. Well, like, just... sort of. He's not going to really have many combinations it, yeah. of those. But And he's, no. just, he's still going to arrive there with so many middling pairs. Think... He's going to have sevens. He's going to have sixes. He's going to have uh, five, six, seven, five. Well, not seven, five, I seven, guess. But... But it's not you. <laughs> Sorry. Seven, five. Sorry, he's I got a little ahead of myself he's there. He's got seven, five. He's going to have nines with a heart. You check. We know. Bluffing um, big error. Pure check. <laughs> big error. What are we bluffing with? Ace five. Yeah, you're emerging. Connie knew. You emerging. Yeah, ace, no, five, you ace, just, five, ace king. Just because we're, we leave ourselves in such a bad spot. Like, mm -hmm. we're betting fucking less than 50% pot. Well, this would doesn't have been feel intuitive, good. Would it have been intuitive to you to bluff ace, queen, ace, king, ace, ace king off? Ace, queen, ace, king. Because I, I would think the other way. I would think bluff king yeah. queen. It's just card removal, and right? Not when you have and not bluff the ace highs. Ace highs because you just beat. You just win sometimes, yeah. yeah. When yeah. you have the bad cards, uh, well, it's more likely they have the good ones. When, right. you, when you have the ace of hearts in your hand, it's kind of like that. I wouldn't bluff. I don't think. Well, that's true. Uh, I mean, yeah. that's that's. I mean, the machine agrees with you. The machine agrees yeah. with you. The ace uh, hearts is a bad card, right. Most of the time, uh, like ace king. Unless it has the king of hearts with it, because now you reduce him to having no. Art, so it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You're not targeting those. He does, yeah, he doesn't have king jack, king ten, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You get, well, it's continue. it's the dual it's the dual effect. You block ace jack and king jack, but you also block king well, queen of hearts and well, ace queen of hearts. You yeah. don't with ace x of hearts. This is spooky to me. I mean, this is kind of nonsense. Like you bet ace, you bluff ace king of hearts for some reason, even though you don't block ace jack king jack suited, and you block all the flush draws that he can have. Oh right, because he's not going to have the offsuit variety. But I guess what you I guess you block can, aces and kings though, which is worth something. That is worth a lot, but yeah. I guess I would just rather use different combos. Yeah, but it's probably more so that the aces with the ace of hearts traps more. The kings with the king of hearts just play call a lot more. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's incentivized to be all in earlier with, without the removal. Yeah. Oh, stop. Okay. I was going to say stop. Like, I thought, like, you check mix on the end with ace, king of spades because you have the good suits. Right. And you hope he's bluffing with king, queen of hearts, but you don't. <laughs> Wow. All right, let's not get too deep down this the, down no, this rabbit but hole. It's weird. Uh, it is weird though. Like, why is Ace King of Hearts jamming? The homie sure. had six five of diamonds here. It's six five of diamonds. He ravaged. It happens. Uh, honestly, like he played good. They both played good. There's nothing better <laughs> than playing deep four bet pots where everybody's a little bit too linear. Yeah. Just to you recap know? real quick. Yeah. yeah. The only was there a mistake on the turn or not? No, no. it mixes. No. Um, okay. but you know, I I think by default having a strategy in these situations where it feels a little bit simpler that either you're mostly checking or you're mostly jamming. Uh, it's probably a lot more comfortable, but cheese very well. By the way, if you guys aren't already on our study group on Discord, just know that this is the man who's leading it. Right. So you guys should get in early before he realizes how good he is and starts fucking charging you. Guys. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. I'm sorry. So if we do take the line of the check turn, because it mixes, correct? Yep. With King Queen. So if we take the line of check turn, we get we see a brick river. Like now, turn goes check check or turn goes turn check go back call? Turn goes check check. Okay. Now, where do we find ourselves on river? I think, no, I I think we bluff again. I think, I, think we have that, I think we have to bluff. Really? Because they cap themselves a lot by checking back. Bad cards, though. We don't block Jack X suited. Mm. You yeah. check it. Yeah. All right, I got one back. Your turn. <laughs> Your check. Your check. Got it. You have bad cards. We want him to have hearts. Yeah, like, yeah that is true. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Like, we're targeting flush draws, well, and we have well, two no, no, no. cards. Right, right. But practically speaking, it becomes a better bluff because oh, you you're also <laughs> targeting, well, you're also targeting, like, a pair of fives and a pair of sevens that the machine's going to call at a really high frequency. Sure. Right? So go B67 and see how often they call those hands. I bet it's almost always. Okay. We, we consider the goalpost moved, but the point made. <laughs> right. But, like, look. Uh, sure. Sixes mix, six, five yeah, mixes. Yeah, yeah, Where, like, those hands are probably just going to pure fold in, in practice. Yeah, I mean. So you get a little bit more fold equity. I'm not trying to encourage a bad bluff. But yeah. <laughs> But basically, what I'm getting at is but like. But you're not, when, not encouraging well, it. Well, no, just what I'm saying is when spots are under defended, well, as, as according to what theory is, we get to over bluff. Oh, shit. Here's, so now reaching to the next right. logical bluff is the one with bad cards. All right, so here's so. what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set the strategy and just assume that these hands that you're talking about pure fold. How about that? Okay. Right. So six, five, let's. All right, fine. Sevens don't really exist. Queen bluff. So it's kind of like King, this, right? This bluff. is about it. Yeah, I think Ace so. five. Ace five, ace four are out, probably. Sure. Yeah. And then Queens is in. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. Obviously, top Queens pair. Queens is in. King Jack better. is in. Yeah, top pair. Better uh, ace ten in. of hearts. What is that? Is that's, that nothing? That's oh, it's, a river, it's a river ten. It's uh, a river. So it, it, it might. Yeah, it, mixes. it might be in. Let it, mix. let, let, it, let it cook. It let it cook. cook. It's cooking. It's cooking. All right. Still check. Says? Still check. Still check. One time. Pure? Still check. No. Still check. 
Woo! Bad hand. Like, You're allowed to stop. You're allowed to let them win. Yeah. What God happens is all the, all the other ones just start bluffing. Just yeah. take out Queens, Jackson, Tons. Just don't oh. bluff me. <laughs> bad, just don't bluff me. Bad cards in your hand. It's that simple. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you think they're doing. You have bad cards. We, it's fine. That was, that was we my manipulated initial, enough to make. <laughs> that was my initial thought, yeah. but at the same time, it's just like when we check goes turn goes check check. It feels like we have like some. Um, just bluff literally anything else other than hearts. We, we just, <laughs> well, it feels like we have like a plank to walk on when we goes check check. Connor's, turn. Connor's point is not invalid though. Like in in practice when. It goes check check that range doesn't look like the machines you know yeah, what i mean right. like people you have to understand how people build their actions in a spot like this a highly leveraged spot like this where reopening the action can get you jammed on people check back the hands that they're afraid to play for stacks with mm -hmm. and that is built around the under pairs to the jack it's not built around the over pairs that are you know trapping to induce the river or whatever the case may be right so you know the queens the kings the aces that are in there on the end the jack x like yeah, we don't want to play the game of just like fully capping him and then saying, well, can we rifle it off? Of course we can. We know that, right? It just depends on how much they check back the turn. Oh, with aces and kings. That, right? That's what uh, I'm saying. Like, like they're going to go quarter and, on the turn, but if they check back, they're probably more, ca right, more right, capped. Right, right, but exactly. Like, that, just, that's what I'm getting at is, is we don't need to run the experiment of what <laughs> happens whenever they suck at their turn check back frequency. Sure. We'll know that in game, right? And we'll be able to take advantage yeah. of it. Uh, so Landon's point is the bigger takeaway. You're here. allowed it's to like, just like have some check folds, and like yeah. this is one of them. Yeah. You're like, allowed bluff, to give up. Bluff literally any other combo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like literally anything else. Literally just anything with if it's ace king of hearts, king queen of hearts, just check. You know, okay. like, you got it. I got hearts. That's bad. Ace king queen of spades. Go. Like, go. Cook. Cook. <laughs> Try. Uh, Do your best. You know? Okay. So. Chi, you're, you're you're out of the muck. We're not surprised. You're a fucking child of the sim in the making, mm. out there crushing it. If you guys haven't already, be sure to join our Discord community. Chi leads a study group once every other Saturday. A uh, lot of community participation there. I personally think he's one of the brightest students that's come through the academy in the seven years that I've been running it. So be sure to get in while the getting's good. And if you, you miss, if you if you happen to miss it, we do put the replays up for free on SolferY.io. Right. You we? just need we a do. free roll access pass. That's I right. got one of those. We'll yeah, it's free. We'll I didn't know those. that. So be sure to hit hashtag Discord in the chat if you want that link, or you can go to at TV on Twitter. It's our pinned tweet. You can find the invite there. Also, if you want to submit your own In The Muck segment, uh, you can head to our Discord channel. We have a whole forum dedicated to In The Muck. Again, that's hashtag Discord in the chat. It'll give you the link that you need. Be sure to check it out. All right. Let's wrap on a little A-game poker review <clears throat> talk. Uh, big shout out to my man, Elliot Rowe. This is his first book that's come out. Uh, it's kind of built off of a course that he previously had done for, I believe, Run It Once mm -hmm. called A-game poker. Uh, very dense book on mental game and everything that comes with it. I'm very excited for the audio version of this to come out. First of all, <laughs> nothing is more soothing than Elliot Rowe at 1.25 XP. <laughs> Okay. That beautiful like, British accent. I'm going to struggle because I'm going to have to do it while I'm like working out or walking because I've done enough guided meditation with him where I slip in and out of sleep. <laughs> and I don't think I want to listen to a book that way. But uh, nevertheless, Elliot is one of the leaders in this uh, particular field, especially within our poker industry. And, you know, I have my own story with him that is highlighted in this book. Uh, it might be like chapter 32 or something like that. But. Um, you know, we put a tweet out yesterday, and if you guys haven't engaged with it yet, be sure to at OnlyFriends underscore pod. And the question was basically, what is your biggest mental game leak? Uh, I shared mine, and I was kind of surprised at the feedback that it got. Uh, I thought that I told this story enough with, that people were pretty familiar, but got a few DMs and a lot of people within the thread kind of asking about it. For me personally, like, I had a very big resistance around um wealth accumulation and uh just affluence in general you know growing up the way we grew up in a small steel mill town you take a lot of pride in coming from nothing and kind mm -hmm. of rising out of the ashes and you know my first well obviously i'm very much on record my first accumulation of any money when i had 300k i torched through that in record time <laughs> like speed just, run didn't mm -hmm. know, uh, legitimately, when I say I didn't know what to do with it, I legitimately did not know what to do with it. Quicker <laughs> than me in 125? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. wow. 18 months, torched. 
Oh, no, that wasn't quick. Get out of here. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I can't go fuck out of here. That's six months for 125. Get out of here. All right, why 350,000? And I managed to make another WSP final table in between that for another 200. I mean, 200. it was kind Ouch. of a... Uh, Proportionally speaking, equal, right? 125. Kind of. Six months. Yeah. 350. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Good good math there, Lando. That's what the I was saying. That's why you're the uh, computer. Quick math. That's right. Quick math. So uh, for me, like when I came into that money, it was 2010. And, you know, crypto wasn't a thing yet. I was 28 years it old. It was, but. Well. Man, if you would have bought Bitcoin man. back then. Oh, if, oh if, if you just yeeted into Ooh. Bitcoin, you wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> There'd be no podcast. Oh, there would, would be. There would be yeah. a podcast. <laughs> it would take a very different. Th- <laughs> I wouldn't let anybody know that I had all the Bitcoin, yeah. but there would be signs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the signs would be there'd be 20 clones mm-hmm. of Gatsby running around yeah. the house. That would oh, be a start. A yeah. That would be a definite start. Um, and, but, a, and an uncapped crossbook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I came into this money and I literally didn't know what to do with it so i just did what i knew and i fired it into poker i played higher stakes myself i mm-hmm. backed lamana i backed our friend garrity i, I had hel- them playing I torch it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I had them playing stakes Let's that, go. you know they they hadn't put a ton of volume in no. i had them playing 3500 main event wpts like we were traveling all around <laughs> it's stupid shit literally all around the united states that's and was I was just, so fun for you i was just yeah. bankrolling the whole thing yeah, it was not fun for you it was fun for brian it was, oh, I had a blast. It was fun until I had a blast it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it was fun until it wasn't, you know? Yeah. Um, but, until the music stopped? But that did, it didn't dawn on me that, like, I had this, like, maybe mental blockade around the half a million mark at that time. And mm-hmm. I, I just kept, like, you know, going harder and harder and harder. Almost, I, I talked to Conrad a lot about this, the idea of gambler's ruin, where if you don't ever deleverage your risk, you will eventually reach zero. Right. Like, you'll just continually compound your risk to the point where you have to go to zero, right? And mm-hmm. I, I did that. And reflecting upon it at the time, I was just like, no, I'm just a dumb kid who didn't know what to do with his money. Like, I'll do better next time. And I did, luckily. That was the last time I went broke. But there were still a lot of fluctuations in between, you know. Uh, I I immediately pick up a half a million in 2013 and then find myself in Ivy's room. And suddenly, like, I'm just making money hand over fist. But the second that I become a millionaire, every single time that, like, that label got attached, I would find a way to really torch like really, really, really torch, not just small little things here and there, like I'm overspending or something like that, which I did. And it wasn't just like sharing too much with my family, which I also did. It was hardcore torches where I would go from being worth 1.2 to 700 overnight and suddenly feeling better about it. <laughs> right? Uh, legitimately, no, yeah, like, yeah. subconsciously, I just felt like I didn't deserve this nice amount this like level of wealth that was inconceivable to us growing up right remember the people that we used to consider to be the rich kids yeah like the carinos yeah maybe like 200k a year maybe <laughs> probably not probably not like her dad was a lawyer but like you know in a small town yeah they said their family sure together. They did okay I, i'm but, positive yeah. they did okay but like but like, but rel- like they had relative relatively speaking Right, right. They had a pool. Like, right. look around outside. Right. Here. If you from from the vantage yeah. of your trailer park, I'm sure. <laughs> <Exactly>. uh, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> what? No, it, it, like, like think about like the richest family in Leechburg compared to the richest family in Upper St. Clair. Of course, right? or, or, or yeah. anywhere else on earth. That's that's my point. <laughs> right. The median income in Leechburg was yeah. like thirty two thousand dollars. So like, when you're rich, you're making triple that. They yeah. just compared North Las Vegas to Summerlin. <laughs> in essence, in essence, yeah. Maybe maybe East Las Vegas, like just east oh, of the yeah, strip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, like East Flamingo compared to like the the rich golf neighborhood in Summerlin. Yeah, yeah that was Leechburg compared to you know any major metropolis. So uh, I mean, coming from that. And like really understanding what nothing is, not just in a conceptual sense, but like having lived it, having something feels so abundant that it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's 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 it doesn't align with your inner self very well. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like like I'm not an uppity person. I'm not I'm not the the caviar type, if you will. <laughs> you know, like I'm not gonna fit into that crowd. Right. So like it's weird whenever you just have this scoreboard that now segregates you from the thing that you're rooted in. And I think I had such resistance to that that I would just do everything within my power. And generally it was just gambling way too hard to ensure that I would keep myself accountable and like hold my own self down. And it wasn't until I went on a massive downswing where I was playing poorly and I was also running relatively poorly 
that was just like, okay, like I'm now on a $5 million downswing when I have like 800 K to my name. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's pretty monumental. Can't believe we've done this. Um, and you know, to be fully transparent, like I was back for most of it. So the way my deal worked was that I put up a half a million and got a percentage for that. And then I got an additional free roll that was a part of the makeup deal. Skill edge. So yeah, it was kind of like uh, a backing deal with insurance for my own money, right? So imagine like selling it markup effectively is what it was. Like I'm selling it like 1.2 uh, on like 6 million and I'm putting up half a million to get like, you know, some percentage back. Anyway, point being is go on this downswing, get introduced to Elliot. Uh, and he basically walked me through everything that you're going to read in this book. Everything from, um, you know, setting good routines, becoming disciplined, becoming resilient, which I had a lot of those characteristics already, but this game in particular through variants has a way of really beating you down. You know, I don't care how resilient you are. I don't care how able you are to bootstrap and pick yourself back up. There's going to be a day where something happens and it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Whether it's a day, whether it's a couple months. It's a culmination, obviously, right? But, mm -hmm. like, something is just going to happen where it's, like, that's the last straw that right. you can't take anymore. Um, so he, he really helped me understand this, like, inner self-sabotage that I, I had formulated. And the reason why it wasn't that big, that big of a problem is because it was around a number that was so large that if you sabotaged at a million, it's okay. You're still 100,000 air, and you're doing pretty <laughs> good for yourself, you know? Um, but you know, we were able to kind of like work through it a lot. A lot of it obviously came from my upbringing. We did a lot of work around, uh, just identifying, right. The, the biggest thing with Elliot that I think he offered was identification of the problems. It wasn't even necessarily that he was trying to promote that he was the solve for everything. Right. Uh, especially as somebody like myself who takes a lot of pride in being a problem solver. It was so much more of being, having my eyes opened to where these issues all lie and then saying like, okay, now I got to get my hands dirty. I, I got to do a lot of the tough work. And he was a guide throughout all of that, but it really does take some level of self-awareness and ability to kind of like really strap in and say like, okay, there are certain things about myself that I need to change in a positive way. Uh, and he was just a massive mentor for that. He was a, a huge helping hand. And for anybody who's not fortunate enough to work with him, especially now that he's expensive as fuck, <laughs> uh, this book is like a really great uh like mediator it, it's it's a good in between uh i know that you know you guys have all read through it I'm, I'm talking a lot uh because i have experience with it but you guys all read little snippets of this did, did any of it kind of resonate with you i don't know how much you guys have worked on like mental game or anything along those lines throughout the course of your careers yeah i got called assigned chapter 33 which is about motivation and how to kind of keep yourself not only, not only going in poker but more so the mentality around the grind as a whole mm -hmm. and it's kind of funny that i got kind of uh, chosen this chapter where for the past it wasn't funny it was nikki <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything is very calculated so. yeah so mm -hmm. calculated from nikki i got 33 which was about motivation and playing poker where for a while i definitely took time off differently like my priority shifted from playing poker and studying and running spots and doing all the things that called like an A, like an A grade poker player would do mm -hmm. and took a back burner for more like fitness, health, well-being, like relationships, uh, things along those lines. So I don't know when exactly it happened, but I had that moment where I didn't want to play as much anymore. And not only did I not want to play as much, but I didn't want to try as much. I was kind of getting a lot of the value through friends where friends would be playing high stakes tournaments, like lucky enough to work with Chewy, who is like in super high roller bowl and doing all of the all tough work and the day-to-day -day stuff and putting sims in the chat where i stopped doing that work myself and started relying on friends to do it right so for a long time i wasn't really doing very much i was kind of being the benefactor of value from my friends and now call it since the start of this year uh prior to the cross book that even happened i sort of felt i felt back in love with poker to Showing up, playing online, running spots, looking at final tables, and putting in a lot of the work that I was avoiding. And I think a lot of the reason I personally avoided all of that work was from of the like ego prop of if I never actually try, I'll never know how good I can actually be. 
Yeah. And it's kind of a, a self-limiter where you don't want to try as hard as you can because if you fail, now everyone that call it, doubted you was correct and everyone that believed in you is wrong. Right. So you kind of put that... You're a paper champ. Yeah, you, you paper mm-hmm. champ it versus like actually winning. So like just reading through that and then realizing that there's just the difference between uh, like the passion, the way that people see passion for the game, where in the book it's like, Passion isn't the love for something, but it's the ability to endure and struggle through something. So is this something that you're willing to struggle for versus do you just love it? Right. And there's a difference between having like that passionate drive versus the infatuated drive of, I love this game so much. uh, I want to study and do all of these things. But at some point, I'm going to reach a day where that love becomes stable and non consistent and dies. Right. And I went through that period last year where I kind of got to that stage of comfortability where I didn't have to call it play online cash as much anymore because I've made enough money to sustain for a while. And now I'm back in that place of, okay, this is something that I'm willing to to grind for. I also think like, Mm -hmm. uh, and I can relate to this, like you're not motivated by money. And in a game where that's the scoreboard, that's a really big limiter, right? Like you now really do have to find some other motivating factor that doesn't wean right because if it's just validation or it's just uh you know trophies or putting up w's it it becomes you just accomplish it and then quit or not quit but like not care right where uh you're you're always going to need some amount of money like we chose this path for a myriad of reasons independence largely being one of them but part of that independent path is being independently wealthy but we wouldn't have Mm -hmm. done this if poker was free right 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 if it were if it were the chess route where it's like the max you're going to make is a you know not a a wage not a comfortable living no no one's going to fall into this right you know there's a reason we're not playing video games it's a very Mm -hmm. weird well shit have you seen fucking esports okay Okay, well (laughs) video games when we grew up it's a little bit easier to be a poker player more for the boomer guy because like when you're in esports like you're playing against 15 year old crackheads that are just off of adderall every day (laughs) you're fucked you know those kids got reaction shelf life is pretty short here yeah and it's one of these things where like call it recent example being the win at the for the 400 like this was not a surprising result to me or you or right. anybody that knows like how i personally see the game or like how poker works yeah but like at some point just having the not just paper results of being good but the proof that Actual you are results, yeah what you are Got trying to be is important right mm-hmm. and it's not important for me like i don't i don't care you know, but I'll do what needs to be done for myself now. And part of like maximizing this cross book, maximizing uh, like the EV of the spot is show up, go play live tournaments, get in the grind and get better. Mm. And this was part of that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it feels good to like have that pre WSOP mentality like built up now versus getting to the first day of the series and be like, okay, like now it's on. Right. right yeah. Well, what about, uh, what about you guys, Lamana? Well, now I have to go after you two who just like, well, that was Said intentional. So, we, yeah. we knew you guys weren't going to say a lot. So, right. You know. Well, I mean, there's really nothing left to say. <laughs> no. Uh, so, like, my, my chapter was, um, it's called, it was, the name of the chapter is uh, A-Game Skill Stack. Mm. So it's essentially about stacking different types of skills. And, you know, he, um, you know, he, he kind of, uh, he said that, like, uh, like, like a CEO of, of a company isn't just good at business, right? They, they have other skill sets that allow them to rise to be this be a CEO, allow them to, to maximize their potential earn, right? Athletes do this too, right? right? The best, the, the most uh, profitable athlete isn't necessarily just the best player. It's someone, you know, who's very charismatic and, and very marketable and, and, you know, they can get endorsements and stuff like that. So you have to have all these other skill sets when it comes to poker just not poker skill right right and so like some of the things he outlined was uh like 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 bankroll management right and it's like i know it's something that you struggled with Mm -hmm. right something i struggled with too like and and it's not just about being uh you know like like risking too much it's also about being too conservative right you were the opposite right yeah exactly so it's like there's like opposite extremes right i think like um you know, where you're saying just like, well, if you never ever take, like, if you're playing in a game that you're so well rolled for, then you're just missing out on a ton of money when you can, you can beat the next level up or the next level up. Right. Right, Guapo? 
Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe we should have uh, given him that chapter. <laughs> uh, like some of the other skill sets are like, uh, like okay, so like game selection, mm. right? And this is like you know a, a, a big one too, where it's like okay, yeah, I could, and it's 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 funny how like you think about like the the bankroll management and like oh you need to play like shouldn't play so low, but yet also like how it's intertwined with bankroll management right, yeah. right? there's like it's like a dance you have to do where you 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 want to game select and you want to play in games that that you know you you're beating but also not you don't also want to like play in something that's too high and then you 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 know you're not you're not earning you're enough. okay taking or you're, you're or, okay playing up you, right at the cost of a big blind per mm-hmm. hundred win rate right but you're not okay playing up at the cost of dollars per per hundred win rate right like it's okay to play twice as high for 75 percent of Mm -hmm. the win rate because you're making more money right but it's not okay to play twice as high for less than half the win rate right right yeah and and a lot of a lot of a lot of players i think they they'll get like egos right and they won't want to like go back down move move down yeah Yeah. maybe, maybe the game that they're playing in is just it's not a good game and but you know they're at a casino and like this game is just this is their normal stake but the game is trash it's all tight regs right and but then there's a game one stake down that's you know people just throwing parties right well, go play in that game because your your win rate's probably gonna be higher in that game than it is in the in the one that's right above it yeah so like it, it's not about having like an ego and stuff like that and, and being able to find the find the good games right there's a lot of players they, they say there's like a lot of players that Maybe they might not be the best poker players out there, but their their win rate is higher than players that are much better than them because their game selection is is that good. Yeah, so and you, I, I think at the top of the hour when I was kind of talking about the privileged position that I'm in with mm-hmm. private, that that's a great example. Of yeah, it, right. It's like maybe I'm not the best cash game player in the world, but like I might get some of the best opportunities, and mm-hmm. that in and of itself is just worth a ton of money. Yeah, well, it just comes from the entitlement that because somebody's good, they deserve to play, mm-hmm. and that's there's not a lot how of it soft works. skills. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, like you uh, great at poker and you're a dick. Like no one wants to play with you. <laughs> <laughs> and like networking is like another like huge skill that you need to have because it's like you can't do it on your own. We've talked about this so many times on the podcast. Like if you're just out there trying to learn the game by yourself, it's so hard. I mean, sure, some people can do it, but they're very far few in between. Having a network of people that you can bounce ideas off, that you can talk to, that that are better than you, that can can relay information to you, and you know, and you back and forth. It just helps your game. It accelerates your game so much faster than it would if you're on, if you're on your own. He made a good, uh, you know, a good point in uh, in the book. Elliot did, where he said that like, you know, it poker's an individual game, right? Mm. When you play in poker, it's individual, right? But um, it's like it's kind of like a uh, like an MMA fighter, right? At that when you're when you're an octagon. Is that the octagon? Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you're on your own. You're on your own, right? You're, on, you, you're on your own. It's an individual game. It's you versus the other guy. And um, but when you're when you're training, you have all these people around. You're like you, a full right? team. Right. You have a whole team. You have someone for your nutrition. You have someone for your fitness. You have someone for you know, your technique and all these different things. And they help you along the way and they train you to get you better. So when you get into that uh in that arena, then you are, you know, the prepared the yeah, best it's you the, can be. it's the notion of like defaulting back to your training. right right yeah. exactly and poker's the same way right, right. it's just like it, i know like landon you have like some of the best minds around like yeah. you know who you work with and it's i'm sure it's improved your game beyond com- hashtag you know, discord in the chat if you haven't already be right. sure to uh head on over there I, conrad I, what yeah. about you what uh what do you got what, what was popping in your chapter i forgot what my chapter name was but it was about closing the gap basically between like you and the highest the most elite players in the game and it was just not even about like skill wise because like there's so many um in this day and age there's just so many things that we can use like so many resources that we have to get better at the game it's like what else are other people doing so like when i read it i took it as like you know like gym working out and stuff like that doing stuff more for mental game type of stuff and well, i think the big thing to understand is that getting better in this game is not linear yeah i think people believe it to be like a, a step-by-step process like a where it's like get games kind of where, where it's like okay i learn pre-flop and then i learn flop and then i learn turn and then i learn river and then i go back and i refine all of those like that's that's not really the progression to acquiring skill or talent within this game right it's so fluid because everything is interdependent on one another so mm-hmm. it's like yeah, you're going to tweak a few things pre-flop and now that's going to draw this massive uh, amount of confusion to you in certain spots post-flop. 
and you're going to have to like really hammer hammer and chisel your way through and everybody's going to have different blind spots. So it's impossible to progress linearly because that would imply that either you have no blind spots or that no one has blind spots or that everybody's blind spots are uniform. And that's not the case. If you're risk averse, your progression is going to look wildly different than the person who's really risk on, Mm -hmm. right? You're going to have to temper way different things whenever it comes to your training. And yeah, there is a little bit of a linear element in the sense that you can't really study post-flop if you don't understand pre, and you can't really study the river if you don't understand the flop C-bet strategies. But uh, be that as it may, once you've hammered out the, the basic rubric for how the game is played, what your strategy looks like, everything thereafter is just like kind of coloring within the lines, yeah. so to speak. And nobody's handing you a, a, a paint by number right? It's you have to choose the color palette yeah, and you have to know where you want to start and end and blend it all together in a way that is coherent to both you and uh, protected versus your opposition. Yeah. Um, yeah. It kind of resonated with me a lot. Cause like it's, it was more of leaning on like the talk of mental game and stuff like that. Mm. And just like, there's just so many other things that people do that personally I don't. Right. And it's just like, you know, even though, like, I don't want to go to the gym to get big or whatever. I don't care for that. It's more about the mental aspect of that for me, I thought, and, like, st- stuff like that. A lot of it's very systemic, you know, like, just yeah. getting in the routine, having that edge. Like, it is a mental edge to be able to stick to something for a long period of time, especially in something like poker where you don't get to leave until you have no more chips or you back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More so for MTTs than cash, of course. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, what about you, Guap? Well, I, unlike the rest of these heathens, actually read the book. <laughs> that, um, my guy, I knew saving the best for last. Um, chapter 18 talks about, this is what I was assigned by Miss Nikki. Mm. Um, it's sort of like the study chapter. Um, it talks about scaling your skills. Um, and it doesn't really hone down on the fact that you should be doing more studying, but how you study and how you approach your study. Um, he talks about a segment of poker players Um who enjoy taking in content like when the first when when there's a new book out they're the first one to read it when there's a new training video out they're the first one to watch it um but that in the long run could affect how you play and and not in a good way because you're taking in so much content you're not actually grasping uh the base fundamentals of of what you're learning right and how that can really hurt you um elliot doesn't really go into like how to play three bet pots out of position but what he does do is uh, teaches you three stages of study. There's an acquisition stage, uh, there's a practice stage, uh, and there's a review stage. Practice obviously being the last one. Um, the review stage to me seemed like the most, it, it resonated with me because it's something that I, that I struggle with. Um, I kind of like learn tricks and then apply them and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Um, I think I've made money at this game because I've played for so long and I've learned so many tricks but I don't necessarily understand always what I'm doing. So that's why it resonated a lot with me. Mm-hmm. Um, he uses a quote from uh, from Joshua Waitzkin. Oh, very good book, Art of Learning, if you yeah, guys ever get the learning. chance to check it um, out. And it says, it's rarely a mysterious technique that drives us to the very top, but it's rather a profound mastery of what may well be a very basic skill set. So to, what that means to me is just truly understanding the fundamentals. And once you get that, learning the minutia of all these videos that you're watching yeah. uh, all these books that you're reading start to make more sense and you can apply these things a lot better yeah. yeah yeah i think that's a really great great point to to hammer home especially for i think people think of mental game as being like the goggins like mentality where it's just like you're so resilient and tough and like yeah that's that's an aspect of it developing like calluses uh or, or some callus on your your mind and being able to take the shit storm of variance that it'll throw at you that that's really important but I think the other aspect of it that people really just don't really see is how much dedication and energy it takes to not just study, but study properly and to learn a new uh, skill in a a tangible way that will allow you to apply down the line. Like, you know, you mentioned Joshua Waitzkin and and the book, The Art of Learning. It's, It's so critical to have that sort of foundation that they speak about in that book where you are now efficiently progressing through the stages of learning whenever you're talking about a game so complex. Otherwise, you just spin your wheels. And that's where the mental breakdown happens, right? It's, it's not being able to identify that your opponents are doing something well because it's foreign to you. 
you see an overbet come through in a spot that you thought was capped at like pot and all of a sudden it's just like oh that guy sucks he's doing something bad i'm gonna overcorrect and yada 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 well if you never follow through on that and you never actually try to identify how bad that's that that bet is like how much could he possibly be losing by taking that strategy only to come to find out that overbet is a chosen strategy in the spot and you're just blind to it because you haven't gotten there yet you fall victim to your own hubris and that's so readily available to protect you in this game because it is so high in variance. You know, even way before we had solvers and everything else, you could date back to the early 2000s. And the most difficult question to answer as a professional is, am I winning? And the reason is, is that it's so easy to write everything off to bad luck, right? It's so easy to look at a downswing and just say, well, we, we don't really get good samples live. So it's just reasonable that, that I'm was the, me every time. Yeah, every, I'm the unluckiest human around. Every like I, I've, I've felt like that. I'm like, I'm like, I'm just so unlucky. Like I'm yeah. really like, it's just like, oh man, just running so bad. And that's why I'm not winning. Like, this is so dumb. Why am I so unlucky? Like you trick your mind into thinking these things. And it's just like, well, this when's the last better. time you studied? When did, yeah. Like, what have you, what have you been doing to improve your game? And like, these are the things that you need to concentrate on. Not like, am I, am I the unluckiest person? Right. No. <laughs> Active study, <laughs> passive study, hands-on yeah. study. All of this stuff is very important. And guy, it all very much weighs on your mentality. The guy at the Jewel the other day called me the luckiest person at South Point. Flopomatic. <laughs> the luckiest person at South Point. That's Tell a lie. Tell I'm a like, lie. I'm like, I'm like that. I was like, now I feel like I'm doing something good. If, if, if it mm. looks like I'm just like so lucky all the time. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a really good thing. All right, well, tell right? tell him the reason why he called you the luckiest person in South Point. Oh, because I I hit an ace on him and I, I like rivered in like a three out. Oh, we thought you hit a jackpot 20. with quads. I did hit a jackpot <laughs> with quads. That that that's all. That is I that is lucky. I did hit the hot the, the hot card. The hot card, card. The hot card baby. <laughs> yeah, just flop quad deuces. You Does know, the guy selling the fucking. Hot he wasn't dogs? at the table. If he was at the table, listen, this guy said I'm the luckiest guy because. I hit a three outer on well, him you, in a twenty five dollar pot. You're lucky because right? you beat him. In a right. Yeah, right. but like if I if, if he was at the table when I flop quads for a thousand dollar jackpot, his head would explode. I just want to know if the hot dog guy says hot card, hot card. It's a deuce today. It's a deuce, guys. What hot dog guy? The fuck do you mean the hot dog guy? The hot dog guy. I thought the hot dogs are gone. Oh, you mean the hot dog stand? Yeah, yeah. you know, the hot yeah. dog guy. It, 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 does, it doesn't move no. around. It, it stays yeah. it's, it's a stationary, <laughs> it's a stationary, stationary hot, hot dog, dog stand. stand. Yeah. It's kind of interesting to me that, like, when it comes to the lucky, unlucky narratives, that people want to propagate the narrative that makes them feel the best. Oh, for sure. 100%. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, in reality, it's like, look, man, equity is what it is. Cope mm -hmm. is a powerful, powerful It really drug. is. Cope and we all prevents do it, you from right? actually, yeah. like, getting better. That's true. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, for sure. Absolutely. Is it, right? If you could just blame blame all like you losing just on bad luck, then I don't have to. I don't have to study. I don't have to get better. I, my luck will just turn around. I'll just wait for that. Right. It's yeah. easier to do that. Way easier. Try. Yeah. It's also easier to exploit Grandpa Joe for all of his money and then cross book at 110. Uh, <laughs> percent On that note, uh, we are going to get out of here for the weekend, team. I hope you guys have a great one. We're going to be back Monday at noon Pacific. For all the usual shenanigans that you can expect from us, don't forget we are running an academy in May. If you want any more information on that, just hit hashtag academy or head to academy.solverwide.io. We're also doing dealer academies all through the month of March. So if you're considering dealing for the WSOP and you need job placement, this is the place to go. Same same site, academy.solverwide.io. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell, and head over to our uh, Twitter at onlyfriends underscore pod. Make sure that you retweet, like, and comment on the thread if you want a chance to win your own copy of Elliot Rose A Game Poker. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you as always. We'll see you next week. Later, squad. Wakes up Peace. in the morning.